Welcome everyone to tonight's school committee meeting. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Mike Mazzoni, can you lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure, thanks. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a consent agenda, the minutes from December 10th, 2015, and oath to bills and payroll. I can move to accept the consent agenda as read. Both have been made. I don't second my amendment. Second. Most of them made and seconded. Is there any discussion on the uh, any of that? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. All right. Um, interested citizens, we do have a uh, agenda item to talk about school start times, which I know some people are going to be very interested in. We will have another community input section for that particular topic. So if you if you want to talk about that, you might want to hold on. Um, what we'll do is we're going to have a discussion about that, and then after we've chewed around it a little bit, we'll open it up and for questions and, and input from the community. But if anybody else has anything else that they would like to talk about beyond that as part of the, the first of the interested citizens section on the agenda. All right, thank you. Seeing none. All right, recognition. Uh, we do not have our student rep tonight, so we'll go past that. Winter sports programs. I just wanted to uh, take a minute to... Uh, acknowledge a, a very strong start to our winter sports program our hockey teams basketball team uh, indoor track uh, they're all doing very well our indoor track team keeps growing in size and, and that's, that's great to see in the past few years it's, it's remarkable how many more kids we have in that program uh, great sportsmanship and a number of strong wins and in track we've set a few records uh, early in the season so very pleased with our, the performance of, of those athletic track events to date I also wanted to mention a partnership that uh, we just finished uh, actualizing with uh, the Council on Aging and the Public Library. Our uh, high school librarian, uh, Mrs. Hines, uh, offered a genealogy course to uh, our seniors in town. And uh, they had an opportunity to uh, come in and take a look at the program that we use in our library. And uh, we got some great feedback. Another great example of how we're uh, extending uh, our arms out to the broader community and uh, bringing them in our schools and offering some of our expertise uh, to help them out. So I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in, in that project. And that uh, brings me to the end of my recognition. All right. Uh, uh, before we move yep. off to recognition, yep. um, they had the open house at the bistro since our last meeting, and I want to say that it was a success. I, was, I attended, I don't know who else attended, but um, the students were very excited, um, and it was actually very nicely presented they did a really nice job yeah, thank you yeah that seems like it was months ago but uh, <laughs> you're, you're right uh, uh, it's really nice to have that program uh, added to our high school it certainly meets the needs of some of our students and uh, they they were just so proud to show it off that day and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, finding opportunities to evolve the program as, as we uh, move along. It's, it's new to us as a district. We've been reaching out to other districts that have had similar programs and uh, we're excited about the potential that that program will bring to the high school. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Work. All right, uh, I've got a couple presentations here. The first is uh, Littleton High School Chorus. Mr. Bergman, Yes. what do you got for us? Good evening. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Littleton High School and and uh, the eighth grade chorus, choral programs, we've had uh, we've been given the opportunity to uh, uh, drive on down, uh, take a field trip down to uh, the uh, Dunkin' Donuts Center for the uh, at Providence Bruins hockey game, and uh, perform the uh, Amer America the Beautiful at, uh, at the start of the game. And then, uh, and then have the opportunity to attend the game. So a group of uh, 35 students uh, from both the eighth grade chorus and the high school chorus from this year. Uh, we would be traveling by school bus going down. It's Friday evening, February 26th. So we would leave at approximately 5 o'clock and uh, head on down there, uh, perform, and then have a wonderful evening of, uh, of hockey 
I, I must confess, uh, growing up in South Florida, that this would be my this would be attendance-wise my first hockey live hockey game. So uh, as much as I love watching Boston on TV, I've never had the opportunity to attend. So I'm looking forward to it just as much as the students are. Uh, it's a great opportunity once again for the eighth grade students to bond with some of their upperclassmen colleagues, uh, hopefully gaining uh, support not just uh, with between the uh, grade levels, but uh, hopefully. Uh, feeding the eighth graders uh, how wonderful it is to uh, be a part of the course at the high school level and hopefully get them enrolled uh, at, during their high school careers as well. So uh, being an out-of-state trip, I'm uh, asking the committee's permission to uh, go on this field trip. It uh, will be funded by the choral programs between the two schools. The funding is already there and um, it's approximately $20 per student uh, plus, uh, plus bus uh, bus cost and uh, so uh, I'm asking the committee's permission to uh, uh, go on this field trip. So. Are 35 students going, you're going, yes. is there any other adult supervision that's going along as well? Absolutely there will be, there's already, uh, there's already been parent interest in attending the game so okay. those parents may wind up, uh, I will tap those parents first to see if they want to save the gas in their vehicles and join us on the buses. Uh, there are a number of uh, active parents who, uh, whose students are involved in the programs, and uh, I'm confident they'll be able to uh, get the uh, student, uh, the parent chaperones, uh, probably at least three or four, okay. should be uh, should be sufficient to uh, cover uh, this group of students. It's a wonderfully behaved group of students, so I'm not not too concerned about any sort of behavioral issues. Okay. Any other questions before we entertain a motion? I know you caught my questions before I need to ask. Yes. Try to do that's what a leader does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will uh, in order of questions, one time motion. Make a motion to approve the um, course field trip to uh, Providence, Rhode Island on February 26th. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. Have a good time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it from the, thank you committee. Thank you. All right, we are going to just quickly jump back a couple items. Olivia walked in. Do you have a uh, report for us with you? I are you do. ready? I don't want to, I know you just sat down. Are you? I, I'm good. All right, good. All right. It was a taco night at my house. So oh, no, no, no. I appreciate you <laughs> wrenching yourself free. Um, this week at the high school, well, today there's a track meet, which is why Dr. Harrington can be with us this evening. Um, the mid-year exams for the high school are next week, and the winter semi-formal and term closes on the 22nd. The middle school and Russell Street had geography bees on the 8th. Um, I don't have who the winner was for the middle school, but for Russell Street, it was um, Dennis Rizzi. Um, then Shaker Lane has their winter fest and basket raffle on the 29th. Excellent. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm going to jump back into the second presentation. We have a presentation on the nano engineering program. It's a joint program with U of UMass Lowell. We've had some students that are participating in it. I believe they're here tonight to give us a little rundown of their experience. Right. Last year at this time, we were just talking about uh, entertaining a partnership with UMass Lowell. And we uh, had one initial meeting, I believe it was. and. Uh, we uh, were very uh, pleased that we were able to strike a partnership with them and be able to offer a course this term. We had seven uh, students uh, take part in the nanoengineering course. We wanted a course that was unique, that uh, wouldn't be offered by any of our staff in the school, and give our students an opportunity to uh, entertain a rigorous course in, in college. I had an opportunity to attend the final presentations these gentlemen uh, presented their projects at. and. Uh, what amazed me was the, the caliber and rigor of the content for an introductory engineering course. Uh, the other thing that really struck me is uh, a lot of their, their presentation and dialogue had to delve into organic chemistry. We don't offer organic chemistry at our high school. Uh, being a science person myself, a cell biologist, uh, I was intrigued and, and very interested in terms of how they, they uh, were able to master the various components of organic chemistry that were applicable to their projects. That's something they had to do on their own. It was, it was a self-study. And uh, for them to synthesize that much material into a succinct presentation uh, 
it, it, was, it was incredible to witness, and as a result, I wanted to uh, bring them here this evening so that you could uh, see all the good work that they've done. We're inviting another group uh, next meeting. And uh, again, very exciting venture, very proud of their accom accomplishments. And uh, we look forward to continuing our partnership with UMass Lowell. So at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome Kyle Hubbard, James McDonough, and Joshua Harvey. And uh, just so you know, the course was uh, taught by Dr. Carol Berry from UMass Lowell. And she taught the course uh, right in our high school. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, so this past semester, we took a class at UMass Lowell. Um, it was the introduction to um, nanoscale engineering. And um, so our, for, at the, for the end of the um, semester, we had a final project instead of an exam. And it was supposed to be a culmination of what we learned and what we worked on throughout the semester. And so we picked one topic. Um, it's electrospinning. It's a certain type of uh, creating nanofibers for an uh, incredible variety of applications, which we'll delve into. Um, so we've introduced ourselves, and um, let's get started. Um, this is just the uh, contents and overview of our presentation. We'll start with an introduction to, nano f uh, to microfibers and electrospinning in general, followed by um, the differences between traditional fibers, like in a cotton shirt, versus non-woven fibers, which are synthetics, which ca can do many, they have many applications. Um, a history, the general history of microfibers and electrospinning, um, the applications of those fibers today and in the future, um, and environmental issues, as and wrapping up with a summary. Um, so to start with, uh, this is just an introduction to fibers in general. Um, these are the fibers that uh, listed here, cotton, wool, silk, polyester, or linen. Um, this diagram to the side shows the relative shapes of the different fibers. Um, flax, as you may, well, linen, as you may know, is, comes from the flax plant and is stronger than cotton. It's less elastic and used in twines and ropes. Um, and wool is, of course, from sheep and goats. It readily holds water and is used in clothing and blankets. Um, cotton is, of course, from the cotton plant and is used mainly in clothes, but again, has many different applications. The smallest, although a uh, big limitation for traditional fibers are the smallest fibers that we can manufacture are 10 to 12 nanometers. Um, and our, although the production rate of traditional fibers is far, far greater than that of synthetic fibers, so that's why, we, that's why it's so commonly used for things like clothing, because it's easy to make and easy to use. Um, for example, uh, we, we, today we, can, we have production rates of natural fibers between uh, 220 pounds per hour and 1,000 pounds per hour. Um, for one single unit uh, or a factory. So microfibers are non-woven, so that means they're synthetically produced. And they are usually uh, 0.9 denier, uh, which is a measurement of thread. And that means they're less than about one micrometer. And they're very lightweight and flexible, so they can be used, and uh, they're also strong and durable, so they have a lot of applications. And uh, this is a picture of what they look like. They are basically a sprayed mat of fibers onto a substrate. Uh, these are, uh, there's two ways to produce these. There's a process called melt spinning, which is where a fiber is melted down and sprayed through uh, a something that looks like a shower head, and it's uh, dropped down onto a substance. And then there is a uh, process that is called electrospinning, where a fiber is pushed through a small hole and spun by an electric field. So uh, this is a diagram of how, uh, I think this is melt spinning. Yes, melt spinning. So the way this works is the polymer pellets, which um, this, these are the things that are going to turn into the fibers. They're put into a hopper. Uh, there's a lot of these uh, pellets to make a longer fiber. Uh, they are then put through a, uh, uh, some me mechanism that heats them and uh, makes them a liquid. And they're pushed through this shower head sort of thing. Uh, and they droop down onto a substrate while being cooled so that when they land on the substrate, they are a dense mat of fibers. And then they are, uh, 
then they are put onto a uh, something called a Godet roll, which uh, basically loops the fiber up and keeps it uh, from tangling. So these nanoscale microfibers have been around for about 50 years. They were first invented in the 70s in Japan. They were initially planned to be used in swimsuits, but that wasn't commercially viable because they're so, so small, the microfibers absorbed all the water and became extremely heavy. <laughs> they only really became commercially viable as products in the 80s when a European scientist started using them as cleaning products and um, substitutes for other non-synthetic fibers. The picture here is of one of the earliest microfiber products, which is Ultra Suede, which is still used today, and it's a leather substitute. So, at present, the most prominent, prominent method of spinning microfibers is a process called electrospinning and um, this is what we were mainly focusing on in the nanotech class, this is what we did labs on and uh, how it works is the polymer solution which is used to create the fiber is fed through a very very narrow opening and that opening is spinning and being charged with a very high voltage and this high charge causes the solution by the electrostatic force overpowers the force of surface tension on the polymer solution and that causes it to expand into a very long shape called a Taylor cone which eventually becomes a fiber. Um, and this fiber is collected on a spinning map to create a map. That's why they're called non-wovens. They just collect in a fabric sheet rather than needed to be strung together and um, the specific properties of the matter fibers depends on the nature of the polymer solution. So this is just a diagram that shows uh, how electrospinning works. The polymer is first f fed through the spinning tip on the left side and that's charged and spinning and that forms the actual fiber and um, the charge on the screen is what attracts the fiber and the combination of the electrostatic attraction from the screen and the electrostatic repulsion from the tip and the spinning of the tip and the screen causes it to spiral and that allows for even collection of the fiber on the screen. Um, so a brief history of electrospinning specifically. Um, in the 1600s, uh, this was the first time the documented effects of the cone creating effects, uh, the Taylor cone, as James mentioned, um, was first described. And then in the 1930s, uh, Russian researchers uh, actually electrospun fibers, but instead of nanoscale fibers like we're talking about today, they created massive fibers, generally speaking. So we're still talking about maybe 100 nanometers, which is, is it's not um, very large, but relatively speaking, it was pretty massive. Um, in the 1960s, uh, Joff uh, British scientist Geoffrey Ingham Taylor uh, fully developed uh, the modern electrospinning theory we use today, and the, uh, the Taylor cone is named after him. Um, he, he also developed the uh, mathematics behind, he, he created the mathematical theories that we use um, in our machines today. Um, some basic parameters of electrospinning, how we control um, what fiber we produce as we create it. Um, essentially, as we increase the voltage to the machine, the thickness and density of the fiber decrease. <coughs> as the concentration of the solute, so the ratio of, as, as the concentration of the solution, the ratio of the solvent to the solute increases, the thickness, and d um, the thickness increases while the density decreases. As we increase the flow rate, um, thickness goes up as well as density, again. Um, so, I, I, this is how we determine if, based on the application that you want to, that you're creating the fiber for, um, you use these parameters to determine exactly what you want to create. Okay, so as was mentioned earlier, the properties of microfibers depend 
on the properties of the solution that was used to create the microfiber. And if just one solution is used, that can result in the um, microfiber having a limited range of applications. So a lot of microfibers that, mi microfibers that are commercially produced are uh, made up of two different polymers. And there are two methods of doing this, which are seen here. The sheaf core method has um, two layers of polymer, one on the inside, one on the outside, and the side-by-side -side method is exactly what it sounds like. Examples of, and, and these are created by feeding both polymers into the uh, spinning cone at the same time, so the, they spin together in the same fiber. And applications of these two types of, uh, it's called bicomponent electrospinning, for the sheaf core model, the sheaf core model, um, one example of that is a fabric fiber where the core polymer is really strong and the sheaf polymer has better binding properties than the inner core, which allows them to be made into a more usable um, fabric. And an example of the side by side is when two polymers are used, one of which has really strong but inflexible and the other of which is weak but flexible and that is actually able to combine the properties of the two to make it both strong and flexible. So uh, now that was probably most of the information and we're going to be getting into uh, most of the applications of what these fibers are able to do. So uh, this is a very uh, simple diagram of a filter. Uh, the gray filter on the left is a cotton filter, and the pinker uh, filter on the right is a microfiber filter. So what this picture is showing is the cotton filter is not able to pick up all of those dust particles that uh, go through the cleaner, and some are going to escape and go to the other side and remain in the air, while the microfiber filter uh, is, uh, allows itself to pick up all those dust particles and store them and uh, not allow as many or possibly none uh, to pass through and lead to cleaner air. So another application is an anti-ice coating. Uh, so this can be sprayed onto structures or vehicles or construction equipment or anything. And uh, it has a specific uh, structure that does not allow ice formation on it. It's, uh, so it's um, very durable as well and it can keep companies from spending lots of money on replacement parts because of ice damage or winter damage. It would have been information we could have had last year. That would have helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, that covers all the major applications of microfibers. And these are some of the companies that are actively using them in today's market. The first is Donaldson. It was founded early in the 1900s, producing um, conventional filters for tractor engines. and as the industry is involved, so is this company. They're now one of the most prominent users of microfiber filters. Um, the main, the most prominent product at the moment is called UltraWeb, and that uses a web-like net of microfibers to capture some micron dust particles, and they pride themselves on having a longer life with their filters than most of their competitors. E-Spin is also one of the largest uh, electrospinning companies in the modern market. Um, essentially, they, they also create electrospun filters, um, generally for um, both air and water filters. Um, a big use is in airplanes, um, a, 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 and as well as high-performance masks. When you're, for example, when you're uh, coating a car with a new paint, with a new layer of paint, um, the, the, all the particles are very small and can be very damaging. And so if your filter, um, if the web in your filter is too large, many of the particles will get through and uh, create permanent damage for the user. Um, and yeah. So Biotronic is a, uh, taking a different route on it. They're going to uh, health-based care. So uh, this is a stent. And for those of you who do not know what that is, it basically goes, they, uh, insert this metal structure into a defunctional like artery or vein that's clogged by plaque 
uh, and is restricting blood, blood flow. And they basically pump it up like this, and they push the aside the plaque and open up the channel for the blood to go through so that it can get pumping through the body again. So that's not the application of the nanofibers. It is actually the fact that uh, Biotronic is making a membrane to go around that stent so that it can uh, have healing, uh, it can heal the uh, vein or artery if it was damaged in any way by the uh, plaque buildup. So uh, again, another different route uh, by Fiber Trap. This is a uh, company that makes a uh, trap for bugs and pests, basically. So this is uh, interesting because it's a zero toxin uh, way to get rid of household pests. So this is a picture of a uh, of a trap that they use, a very uh, zoomed in photo, and basically. Uh, these fibers are uh, going to catch the leg of a bug and keep it there and it'll eventually like die out and, or starve or something like that. And uh, <laughs> so this is, a, this is a bed bug leg and it's getting caught in the trap. And so um, parents won't have to worry about uh, using toxins around uh, their children or around any, anybody actually. And uh, they can have a bug free and toxin free house. Yes. Um, biosurfaces is another, uh, they're taking a medical route. Um, essentially, these are two pictures of gauze. Um, on, on the left, this is conventional military gauze, which we use today. And um, as you can see, th this is a uh, picture of clotted blood clotting on uh, military gauze. And it's very uneven, it, and it ac it's actually relatively slow. It takes about 2.5 minutes for blood to really start to clot. Um, to actually stop blood flow. Um, and over here, this is uh, biosurfaces electrospun gauze. It's significantly smaller. And as you can see, um, blood clots much uh, more regularly. And so it stops it faster in about one minute. Um, and th these are, I it's a slow process because it's very hard to make. It's very expensive to make. Um, but more and more of it is get being produced today and more, of more and more of it is being pushed into the market especially for our armed forces. Um, Gray Systems is a company that's uh, <coughs> okay, it's currently uh, producing concrete reinforced from microfibers and microfibers aren't a replacement for structural steel and reinforced concrete. It because it's so small and weak, but what it can do, which is useful, is prevent uh, acts of secondary reinforcement, and that makes the concrete less prone to hairline cracks, which are tiny cracks, which might not seem like much of a problem, but they, in the long run, they contribute significantly to the deterioration of structures, and over time, when ignored, can cause collapses. Um, they mainly occur when the concrete is set and these microfibers just keep the surfaces of the concrete uh, strong enough to resist the stress. And it's also alkali resistant, which also makes the concrete less uh, susceptible to deterioration. Um, however, there, there are environmental issues associated with electrospinning. Um, the vast, vast majority of uh, commercially produced microfibers right now are oil-based, which means they are both expensive, non-recyclable, and non-renewable. Um, this is an end. Once uh, they, they also can, they're a big cause of pollution, as we'll get into later. But um, there is a solution. It's called uh, polypropylene fibers. Essentially, polypropylene is a thermoplastic, which is very simple. Which means that when heated, it becomes mutable. Um, Right now, they're still in early stage of testing. They aren't really commercial yet, but hopefully um, they will be um, pushed into the market. And the reason they are recyclable is polypropylene is a very common plastic. All of you use it today. It's the number five recycling number, or plastic. Um, so it is recyclable, but it also c has its own problems. Yeah, as Josh just mentioned, um, Microfibers are starting to become a major pollutant 
uh, especially in water ecosystems, if they're in clothes or other products, they can simply uh, wash into the the um, water cycle and uh, flow down into major bodies of water. These here, uh, that's a magnified image of microfibers taken from the stomach of a fish in the Great Lakes, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, there's a lot of focus in the media at the moment on large plastics as a pollutant. You, you may have heard of the, it's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch floating around in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, while they contribute more mass um, to the total pollution, scientists estimate that the, in terms of total quantity, total numbers of pollutants, microfibers are taking over. And um, that's a severe issue because they're a lot harder to clean than larger chunks of plastic. It's a particularly huge problem in the Great Lakes where microfibers are now estimated to um, encompass 12% of total pollutant debris. And the issue there is that micro one of the properties of these small fibers is that they attract toxins. Um, and in the agricultural area of the Great Lakes, um, there's a lot of toxins like DDT and pesticides still present in the soil. So the, the microfiber pollution is facilitating the washing of these toxins into the lakes. And, um, that affects the lake's extensive fishery, which, uh, which uh, contributes to a large portion of America's uh, seafood market. And um, that's, that's causing a major headache for scientists and environmentalists because since it's such a new uh, field, people don't know exactly what the effects will be. All right, so this is a uh, this is the future. Uh, everyone likes the future. Um, so this is basically an an idea to uh, have a glove or uh, equipment for the military, so that they can climb up walls, kind of like a gecko or like you know uh, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. That would be or Spider Man. Cool. Or Spider Man, yeah, because who wouldn't want to be that? So. Uh, the, b the way that this works is, well, first they tried to, of course, copy the gecko because who doesn't copy off people? And so uh, the gecko uses very fine microstructures on their uh, feet, and uh, they have an interaction between the wall and the foot, which, is, uh, which are van der Waals forces, which are very weak forces uh, singularly, but in a total it makes a very large force that allows the gecko to cling to the wall. So they were trying to... Um, make microfi microfibers that would uh, kind of replicate what the gecko's foot would look like um, so that they could hear, uh, adhere to surfaces and climb up walls. Uh, actually, our professor at um, UMass Lowell, Professor Carol Berry, she worked on this project. Um, she said it, was, uh, it didn't go over too well and the microfibers weren't really giving them an easy time. So uh, there was a new idea. So, so they kind of gave up on it, essentially. Um, but there was a new idea to try injection molding, which is uh, kind of exactly what it sounds, just injecting plastic into a mold to make a structure. Uh, so injection molding, something to replicate the gecko's foot. Uh, I think they're still working on that, but um, as for the microfibers, it's probably not going to happen or not in the near future. Um, another future uh, for microfibers, and especially electrospinning, is uh, artificial organs. In the United States, we have one of the highest uh, wait lists for organ transplants, and it's a massive problem. And we've, there are other approaches to it, such as 3D printing. Um, they've been using organic, they, they show the st uh, stem cell, and they move forward um, to grow whatever tissue the organ is made of. But organs are very complicated, and it's not just a layer of tissue. So it's just a beginning. Um, thi this is a kidney um, in a, the very early, early, early stage of development. Um, so microfibers, and in this case electro, electro spun microfibers, can be used uh, um, on, on top of a scaffold. So you create a scaffold out of um, uh, various materials uh, in the general structure of a kidney, and then you coat it with electro spun fibers, um, organic ones in this case. Um, and a kidney is relatively simple, bladder even more so, and 
they have they, they are in their stages of testing for these products. Um, and actually, they have lab-grown kidneys have been transplanted successfully into rats, and testing continues. This is another example of microfibers being used in the medical field. This is a uh, artificial, fully functional trachea developed in Stockholm in Sweden, and it was created using a microfiber scaffold, and um, it was modeled on a patient's trachea and the um, and was coated with the patient's stem cells in order for when it was put back in, it wouldn't be rejected by the patient's immune system. And this was actually successfully implanted into a, it, it replaced the trachea of a patient suffering tracheal cancer. Um, a very successful operation. So in conclusion, uh, these nanofibers, they're non-wovens, uh, they have lots of applications, and uh, they are sp they're made by uh, basically shooting them down through a shower head or a thin uh, opening and uh, put onto a structure to have a specific purpose. They're becoming very widespread in the modern world. You probably use some every day yourselves, and uh, they're also being extensively used by the military. Um, but as great as these fibers are, we cannot overlook the environmental impacts of the fibers. Um, it is an imperative that we continue to research. We don't know much about the impacts right now. It is imperative that we continue to research and understand how the uh, fibers affect the environment as well as us, humans. And so as you move forward into this field, we need to be conscious of the impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mark, questions, comments, thoughts? Um, I thought it was a great presentation um, and you seem to have learned a lot. Um, do you know why the Great Lakes has more of a problem than other bodies of water? Um, that's one of the many mysteries of what's going on at the moment, yeah. It's um, they, they do have a theory that it's due to um, the higher rates of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of large manufacturing areas around the Great Lakes. And a lot of the waste inev inevitably ends up in the lakes. That's one of the theories. Uh, my other question for you is, uh, w did you guys get to experiment with making the fibers in your class or uh, other? What did you do with the fibers in the class outside of the presentation? Um, yes, we did. We, uh, uh, we actually used an electric spinning machine that had been built by the um, teaching staff at UMass Lowell. And we, uh, experimented with different types of polymers and different flow rates and sort of the uh, different properties of the fabrics we created. Thank you. So I was ticking off my little questions as I was going through and you answered them all. So let me start with excellent presentation. I mean, you're well prepared, well spoken, and well organized on, on what you put together here. I'm really impressed with it. I don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> you did do a good job because Daryl always has questions. <laughs> they're all, they're all the scratched mix. off now. <laughs> ruined my fun. <laughs> Mike? Uh, the, I thought this was incredible. It sort of blew my mind. Um, and I know that all three of you are students, but I could totally, it was almost like I was watching a documentary by people who work for all these different companies. So I was very, very impressed with um, how much you guys apparently, did you guys all know a lot about nanofibers before you started this course? Uh, not really, honestly. We, we learned a lot. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be patronizing. To learn that much material from start to finish, so the basics behind, or the logic behind them, how they're made, all the way through their practical purposes, the environmental harm, I mean, that to me seems like it could be a curriculum, learning all of that stuff, so I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, what did you guys think of the course? Was it worth, like, was it worthwhile? Do you feel like you got a lot out of it? Yeah, I, th I thought it was pretty interesting. There was a lot of information in the course. Uh, thankfully, it didn't have to be memorized, but, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> Open book uh, project. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was interesting. It covered a lot of topics that I didn't really um, know a lot about or understand much. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure these guys felt the same way, but, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I think one of the major benefits of it was that it was a very good uh, preparation. Um, that's all is what to expect in a college class. 
That um, was my next question. Was yeah. you, do you feel like you're more prepared now? Yeah, there were lectures, there were lab assignments. It felt like you really got a good college academic experience. Well, you did, technically. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, no, the course was, it, it's bro since it's, we can't go there every day, it's a, in this case, a Tuesday and Thursday class. Um, at Tuesdays, we'd spend, the, uh, the lecturer would come out to Littleton and we'd have about uh, an hour into class, and on Thursday, most Thursdays, we'd actually go out to UMass Lowell and y do labs. Um, I think it was, as they said, it, it was a great uh, preparatory experience, and we definitely learned a lot. It covered a large quantity of subjects, and we, we didn't go in depth, uh, in, in, a, in as much depth as uh, to all the different subjects as we did to electrospinning, but um, we still ha had a large berth of subjects to open to us during the course. I don't have any more questions, but I hope you all um, appreciate the fact that this is so groundbreaking that the U of Littleton High School students are taking a course in nanotechnology using a, an electro spinning machine. I wouldn't even know one if I tripped over one, so the fact that you guys got that experience is pretty, pretty incredible. Alex? I, too, have no questions, but I do want to say that this was certainly uh, a great presentation for me. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I probably learned, uh, if you start in September, and learned everything you have up to this point in this class. Um, that's a whole lot of knowledge. I'm taking it all in just from the last 20 minutes or so, so great job. Um, I do uh, want to echo Daryl and Mike's comments about uh, being prepared for college, um, or actually having taken a college class now. Do you all know yet at this point, generally speaking, if you want to go into a STEM field or something else, or are you still trying to figure it out? I think, yeah, most of us are planning on going into STEM fields. Pretty sound, that. Engineering? All of you? Most likely. Yeah, I yeah. think so. <laughs> well, you have plenty of time to figure it out. But That's I'm surprised true. that uh, Mike didn't pitch you guys on UMass Lowell. <laughs> I was going to, but I felt like I talked about it too much. Yeah. Uh, but the pretty incredible facility there, huh? That you got to go to? Yeah. yeah. Brand new. So. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Good man. And it, it is cool. great that we've been able to explore this partnership. I, I don't hear of any other school. I'm sure there might be one or two school districts doing this in Massachusetts, but I haven't heard of them. So this is pretty new. This is pretty cutting edge, uh, both in terms of the material and in terms of the partnership. So thank you for all this information. How does it feel to be finished your first university course? It's pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> in fact, we spent a lot of time uh, talking and, and uh, networking about what do we need our students to have to be successful as they continue on with their their uh, education and you know research is very clear that giving our students some sort of experience or some kind of experience that links high school to college before they actually hit college full-time is a, a very powerful indicator of, of their success as they go on to post-secondary education I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Dr. Berry uh, uh, about a number of uh, uh, academic components and, and uh, a number of questions that focused around academic preparation and uh, how did our students compare to students that had finished high school and uh, were taking the course on campus? And she uh, really didn't even pause before she started telling us how pleased she was with, with the preparation of our students. Uh, their ability to uh, learn information that uh, hadn't been taught to them before in terms of uh, prerequisite information or foundational information. They were able to grasp it, synthesize it, put it together quite quickly. And uh, when it came to the presentation component, uh, in, a, in a course like this, it's a project-based course, so the professor uh, has many presentations to, to look at prior to the end of that course. And she felt that, that our students stood out in a very positive way. They were confident, well-prepared, articulate, and uh, really were passionate about what they were talking about. So I wanted to share that feedback with you. Uh, for, for me as a superintendent, it was an incredible experience to witness some of our high school students taking a, a course of that caliber. Uh, it's not an easy course. It's, it's a very difficult course. Uh, it's an introductory introduction to nanoengineering, but uh, that's a high-level course to begin with, uh, to begin a venture with, with the university. So I'm very proud of you guys, and thank you so much for coming out this evening and sharing your project with us. Best wishes as you uh, continue your uh, academic careers. Can I ask one more follow-up question? 
Do you have a second? So, well, first of all, I, yeah, K Kelly, the superintendent, talks, makes up a good point, which is that like early college design is important, and all of our colleges are sort of getting on board with that. But what you guys did was not like an English, like college English class or college math class. You took a nano engineering class or nanotechnology, microfiber. I don't even know the specific title of it, uh, which is pretty impressive. But now, have any of you taken like an AP course? Too, or are you taking an AP course right now? Yeah, we're all taking AP course. And so, in theory, you can now start as a freshman when you actually go into college with probably almost a whole semester's worth of credits under your belt, which is pretty huge because that opens up so many more opportunities. If you, you're not rushing to take 15 credits every semester to graduate on time, you have more flexibility. So, uh, that's a pretty great thing. Great. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. It was like, it was like lit reading a, a good New Yorker article. You guys covered all the, you know, the, the science, but also the impacts and uh, the history. That was great. Very well done. Thank you. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is good. But given that we are ahead of schedule, I do want to jump around a little bit so that uh, when we have the discussion about school start times, I make sure anybody that's interested uh, who's not here yet can try to get here. Um, so we, we, we'll start with the first item under old business, school committee goals. Last meeting, uh, you had approved them as a school committee, so I just wanted to formalize, uh, formalize this process and put them in the package so that they were uh, visible and, and easy to access for both you and the community. Yes. Uh, all I have to say about right. the goals. All right, so we will just uh, defer school start times for a few minutes. Uh, under new business, we have the Littleton Education Foundation awarding of grants. I wanted to uh, enclose in your package the uh, grants that were actually awarded to our school, <coughs> schools more correctly. And if you look at uh, that page in your package, uh, the Littleton Education Fund uh, awarded over nine thousand uh, dollars in grants uh, to our classrooms. Since the inception of uh, LEF, they've donated uh, through a grant structure over two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars. So quite an impressive amount uh, over time. We are so fortunate to have the Littleton Education Fund in this community and some very dedicated citizens that uh, spend a lot of time raising money and, and promoting our schools and. When you look at some of these projects, uh, without uh, without their work, uh, it would be very hard for us to to be able to offer these opportunities for our students. So, I'd like to uh, obviously uh, thank them for uh, continuing to be our advocates, and uh, our teachers in our district are very appreciative of all the work that they've done to uh, help give our students uh, extra extra opportunities that we probably otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So, thank you very much. Great. Any thoughts or comments on that? Um, yeah, just a, one question. Our, uh, several of them I can see are like equipment and other things there are, and looks like uh, some sessions with some people. Is, is there any other ones that are uh, sort of direct classroom uh, activities or things that we're using to supplement the curriculum? Well, the, the application process goes directly to the board, and they review the projects, and there's some criteria that they look at. Uh, they want to make sure that, that uh, it impacts as, as many students as possible. And they also want it to uh, enrich the curriculum, not be part of the curriculum. And, and I think we've talk, we have talked about that a number of times. We have a fiduciary responsibility to provide the basics for education. And uh, a, a fund like this uh, is, is out there to provide opportunities that go beyond those uh, foundational needs that, that uh, schools have and, and, and should exercise. So they're very good about that. And, and uh, we always have more applications than uh, funding that's available. And they, they take their time going through all of the projects and, and their requests. And, uh, and I commend our teachers because the, the application form isn't just, uh, I'd like to use this money for this. Uh, they have to go through a process and, and justify how it's going to impact student learning. And what are going to be what, what are the long-term benefits going to be of providing this type of programming or or uh, item to our students? So uh, it's 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 a great uh, well-run organization, and, and uh, as a superintendent, I'm just so thankful 
that uh, they're there to help us. Where I was going with that is, is, is I was wondering if it would be appropriate at some point if we could get maybe a short presentation from one of the classrooms that was a recipient of, of one of these things on how the external funding supplemented their their direct education program. Sure. Good, sir. And then the follow-up question I would have, given the process you just explained, is there an opportunity for the LEF to get feedback after the completion of projects so that they understand you know that it, that it was successful or not, which is fine. Well, not fine, but it can be it, it can be worthwhile to understand why, so that the same mistakes aren't made again. Is there a process for that? To through? Well, through reapplication, uh, our, our teachers uh, do reach out to them in, in a variety of fashions. Maybe a letter, or, or uh, sometimes they may be invited in. Okay. So we we you know try to do what we can to mm -hmm. to. Uh, <coughs> provide them with that feedback mm -hmm. uh, again we're, they're busy people like yeah, everybody yeah, at this yeah. table we, we don't want to yeah, impose on, on what three. they've already yeah. done but uh, we're, we're very cognizant of that uh, I do like the idea of, of uh, picking one or two and uh, having them come to the school committee uh, you know that uh, I love to bring these things to you but uh, I don't know how many hours you want to spend with me <laughs> every second week, so uh, we have to balance what we can do yeah. with the meeting. But uh, right. Just I like think that would be a great addition today. Yeah. Um, it was very nice. Yeah. Excellent. And it, it's important for the community as well as you know for us. You know, we're just reflecting that, um, so I think it'll be worthwhile. So sure. You, you can certainly arrange that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else on that? Um, I I have a bit of an in because my wife's on the committee. So uh, I've actually read several of the grants, and I can say that they had a tough decision on a lot of them this year. Um, but there's also a lot that, if you look at, should probably be brought to us or someone else. That some of the ones, I know they have a hard time funding things. They want to fund enrichment activities, and there's things that are on the border on some of these things, right? And that's where they get, um, that's where they struggle the most on whether it's enrichment or not, or whether it's things that the schools sh themselves should be providing, right? And it would be actually worthwhile to look at some of the rejected grants to figure out, you know, if they should be funded through some, if there's another means of getting funding. We already have a process in place for that. And uh, uh, I take a look at the projects that are funded and, and uh, weigh in on them and then have a discussion with the leadership team and, and, uh, and, and some of the staff that have submitted them. And, and we utilize that as part of our budget planning process. So we already have a process in place. And we also have a, the opportunity, if, if we find efficiencies throughout the year in, in one of our budget lines, we, we have that information. So sometimes we can deliver uh, our uh, computing science class at the high school is a prime example when we were able to purchase some robotics equipment for them as a result of some efficiencies that we found. So it's a good point to bring up. We, we do have it covered. And, and, uh, like anything else, we have more uh, requests and needs than we have money, and we have to create priority lists. And yeah. I will also say, good. having read the grants this year, we the grants are uh, have come a long way in the past several years on being um, more specific and um, better focused on what they're asking for. Um, I think the LEF has tried to give feedback on what they're looking for in the grants and I think it's I think the process is going much better oh, excellent mm -hmm. yep. all right very good thank you um, Alex cost center presentation what's that 15 sure. 10 15 minutes I can make it 10 that, that's fine I just want to just want to see yeah. how my time is gonna work out but let's go ahead and do that right. make it 10 see that <laughs> that's funny because I was talking with uh, Steve about this earlier today, and I said it's going to take five minutes. So, <laughs> well, <then make> which <laughs> will all be surprised about me talking for only five minutes. <laughs> so, hey, you're following a tough act. Those guys are pretty good. Yeah, don't, they were. Don't so, I'm, any pressure. I'm going to try to be on and off as quickly as possible. Just click to advance to the next one. Thanks. If you can make this sound like a New Yorker article, you're going to do pretty good. It might sound more like BuzzFeed, but we'll all be happy in this. <laughs> Is this a list of them? <laughs> Let's just get started. I can see you're already running the clock. <laughs> so this is part of our efforts to uh, go more in-depth in public about what our budget is um, and share more about our cost centers. We have eight cost centers. These, uh, we had a presentation, uh, I believe it was last month, on uh, two of our cost centers. These are two more, uh, system administration 
and school administration. Uh, it's pretty straightforward work. Um, for system administration, we have central office, admins and staff, uh, curriculum development, fingerprinting, legal, travel, school committee costs. It's a relatively small cost center. Um, and again, as I said, it's pretty straightforward. Under central office, admins and staff, this is where the bulk of the uh, spending is under this cost center. You'll see the superintendent's office, uh, which includes salaries and supplies, um, business office, system technology, and other central office staff. Now, one thing I want to emphasize, because I am going to run the clock a little bit for you, is that given the size of the school district and the amount of stuff that we do and try to do and plan for, we are remarkably efficient at the central office level. Particularly with a smaller district, you'll usually find that central office tends to naturally have to be either a little bigger because there aren't enough bodies in the district to take care of everything, or that it's going to be tight and you're going to have one person doing several jobs. And I think each person we have in central office and throughout the district as a whole really stretches themselves and I think we've done a really good job as we've seen more mandates coming down with the ad eval, um, realigning our curriculum a couple of years ago. There's so much going on and I think we make really good use of the limited amount of funding we have. Um, and I think that's part of the effort to shift funds as much as possible to the education because central office is only as good as it, uh, teachers in a classroom can be. Um, so I think, we, I think we did pretty well. The business office, uh, so the superintendent's office does pretty much everything in some capacity. Uh, but the, the business office deals with everything from transportation, uh, so buses, facilities of the, of the schools and the grounds, um, fees, everything budget. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole number of things. I'm sure I'm forgetting several of them, <laughs> but I hope Steve will forgive me. Um, system technology, this is a line item that four or five years ago we had a tech team and a lot of what they were focusing on was upgrading our infrastructure, putting out fires, making sure that the Wi-Fi was working. And now over the last two or three years they've been expanding that role because we've invested in the technology so now they can spend less time putting out fires and more time working in the classroom uh, more as technology in, uh, integrationalists, helping teachers use technology to enhance learning, not just for technology itself. Um, and I, we actually had a presentation on this a couple of meetings ago, and I just want to emphasize again the incredible work that the tech team does. Um, so this, this number represents not just the folks who are based at the central office, the tech coordinator, the data analyst, but also the tech team members who are um, in, in the schools every day. And uh, it, again, it's incredible work. It does not include things like software, technology upgrades. Those are included in, in other cost centers. Um, and then for other central office staff, that includes pupil uh, services and uh, curriculum directors. So that's some special ed staff. Um, and then, of course, our curriculum staff as well. Going down into the, the smaller line items in this cost center, we have curriculum development, which has been about $35,000 per year and has been pretty steady. That's uh, mostly used for stipends for curriculum coordinators. Uh, we shifted a couple of years ago from a model of department chairs uh, for an English department or a math department to curriculum coordinators. I believe, and Jerry Lynn will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's up to 6 to 12 level. We have a... Some K to 12, 2 K to 12. Okay. Our, our music, PE, health, mm -hmm. I 2 K to 12. Excellent. So Excellent. And so we provide a reimbursement for uh, teachers and educators who are able to step up into those roles and this is where that comes from. Uh, for district fingerprinting, we talked about this a lot last year. We haven't really talked about it much this year. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a new mandate from the state a couple of years ago uh, that said you had to fingerprint um, all of your staff, in which included uh, coaches and included cafeteria workers, included all your classroom teachers. Uh, so. There was also a cost associated with that, and the state, in an effort to say it wasn't an unfunded mandate, mm -hmm. said, we're going to put this on the teachers and the individuals to get themselves fingerprinted, and there was, I believe, a $65 cost associated with that. Uh, we stepped up as a district, and I think uh, we talked about this a lot last year, but I want to repeat it. We felt as a school committee, and, and the administration felt similarly, that that's not really a fair way of going about 
uh, policy making. And so the district said, you know what, we're going to, there's going to be a large one time cost, but it's worth it. Um, and so we picked up the tab for that uh, unfunded mandate uh, from the state so our teachers and educators and some of our volunteers didn't have to. Um, so that was $10,000 in 1415 this year. It's much smaller again because you only need it one time uh, for the most part. So the smaller numbers just because there are new, new staff or staff who for whatever reason uh, still need to get fingerprinted. That's what that smaller number is for. Uh, we're expecting this number to not rise above the current number of $3,500 simply because uh, you know we're not going to see that much turnover uh, that quickly unless there's a new mandate or something like that. But fingers crossed. That should probably go down in a couple of years. Uh, legal travel and school committee. Legal and auditing costs uh, make up $60,000 and that also has been a pretty steady number over the last uh, several years. I think Steve had said since uh, last six or seven years uh, to be sure it's been pretty pretty steady. Most of these line items have been pretty steady, which is nice. Um, so that number represents not only uh, legal retainer for legal questions, any issues that come up. Sometimes if there's a new law or regulation that comes up that we want to be sure we're in the clear on, uh, the superintendent can reach out to legal counsel on that. And it also includes our annual audit, which we do every year. Um, it includes special ed issues and you know anything else that might come up. For travel, this represents travel to conferences for administrators, teachers, staff, uh, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> sometimes that's uh, really closely related to the professional development category, but this is where most of the travel costs uh, will show up. And for a school committee, uh, $11,000, that's not money we have lying around for <laughs> us when we want pizza or anything. That's uh, most of that, uh, maybe all of that goes towards uh, membership costs <coughs> for the Massachusetts School uh, committee Association, the National School Board Association, um, and then the resources and uh, materials that they provide, as well as the MASC conference that we've sent someone to every year for a number of years now. So those are some pretty good uh, resources for us. And then whenever there's an instance of um, needing to hire a superintendent or a business manager or a pupil services director, the MASC has a lot of resources and can uh, help with that as well. Um, we fortunately haven't had to do that for a while, but uh, whenever the situation occurs, they have the materials there for us. They also help us with advocacy efforts. Um, if there's anything going on at the state level that we need to be kept aware of, uh, they do a pretty good job of that. So school administration uh, is a second cost center, uh, and this one is the most straightforward thing, so I'm not going to be able to buy you much more time. Uh, but school administration, this cost center is only salaries for the principals and their administrative assistants. It only includes, uh, and the uh, assistant principal at the high school. So that's five staff, four principals and the assistant principal, and then the administrative assi assistants in each of the schools uh, for a total of eight. That includes um, guidance, support, and things of that nature. The principal and assistant principal contracts are negotiated by the superintendent, whereas the administrative assistant contracts are uh, negotiated as part of the secretary's union which is on the same calendar cycle as the LEA's contract, which will be up in FY17. So got that uh, to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, we and going back to the legal a little bit, we have been able to save costs um, on legal a little bit because of using the IBB, the interest-based bargaining approach to contract negotiation. Um, means we need the lawyer in the room a lot less. Um, so that's one more benefit of that approach that we adopted for the first time the last time we, we negotiated. Uh, so that's uh, these. Th those are these two cost centers, and they again they make up a relatively small part of the school budget. Uh, you'll see a little uh, some, I think, normal increases over the last year from the appropriated budget to this year's appropriated budget, and then if you look over the last several years, going back to FY12, FY13, it's been even slower growth, uh, which I think shows the dedication that the district has had towards retaining, uh, keeping the funding towards the teachers, towards the students as much as possible and doing our best to make sure that uh, system administration and school administration is not uh, the focus but enables the learning to happen. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you. Um, just want to lead out with one comment um, directly related to what you just kind of summarized. The, the head count uh, for the central office staffing and for the, for the admin has been flat. 
Um, the costs have gone up a little bit because we, you know we have to keep, you know do things, but we have done a very good effort of. In, and you said at the beginning of the presentation, the responsibilities and the workload has gone up, mm -hmm. up significantly. Significantly, yes. And we have not added headcount in those cost centers to deal with that. We've managed to deal with it as a district, and, and that speaks a lot to the leadership, but also speaks to the commitment that th that those particular staff have to Littleton Public Schools and, and the job that they're doing. So I just wanted to, you know, that's why this is a great ex exercise to go through this is it highlights those types of things and gives us the opportunity to talk about that. But that is significant and it's been a challenge and they've responded, you know, in these difficult budget times and it's, it's reflected, as you said, Alex, directly into, you know, an Im a positive impact on the classroom. So we appreciate that and it's a terrific opportunity to just, you know, reflect on that a little bit. So. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I'll we'll start, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. We've got nothing else on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Daryl? No, I'm fine. All right, Mark? Um, I think it's a great presentation. What would be nice to add is what the relative, um, you said that the central office and the numbers are low um, percentage-wise, but you don't actually, what are the percentage? Oh, for the cost centers? Yeah. Uh, I can for th Versus up. the overall budget, it's stolen though. Yeah. Uh, I can pull that up. But and, and the other interesting uh, chart would be to see what the relative um, the ratio of the centers over time, right? You over, the, over like several fiscal years? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you will see if you go back, I believe it was last meeting we had our last uh, financial update. That will show previous year spending uh, both appropriated and expended, and then the current year's appropriated versus the expended versus how far we'd expended last year. Um, and that's a pretty good gauge. And that will also show the cost centers in full so you can see, oh, this makes up, uh, you know, X, some X percent of the right. district budget. We do have the district budget um, when we have all grants and everything in, um, just under 20, 20 million, I think, is a good number that we've used. Um, depends how, how you count it. Uh, but so if you see... 1.1 1, 1. 1 million for system administration and seven, uh, 700,000. Less than 5%. Eight. Yeah, less than 5%. Thank you. Um, less than 5% of the school budget, the district budget is spent on school administration and system administration. So I think we do pretty well. Um, and as, as Mike was saying, the workload has gone up. And I think if you look historically since 2010, 2011, you've seen more change and more demands placed on local school districts like ours since at least 2002, 2003, probably going back to 1993 when we did ed reform in Massachusetts. There's been a huge influx of programs at the state and federal level. Um, we've had those conversations before, but it's important to reflect again. We're doing so much more uh, with the same amount of money. So. It's an interesting comment, Mark, and I've never crunched it like that, but um, w what is the ratio and how has it trended over time? My guess is uh, based on the years that we've been the budget, that it's trending, the ratio is trending down. We're spending less as a, as a ratio of overall spending. But I would be interested to quantify it. But with the caveat that Alex just raised, even though the, the money you can do year by year would be more difficult to quantify the amount of we benefit we get out of it and, w and what's getting done. But it would still be pretty interesting. Maybe we'll try to do that at some point. Um, that would be somewhat edifying yeah. to see. And that's not to say that because of these new programs and mandates that we haven't been spending more money on them, I think we'll see that more in professional development, for example, mm -hmm. um, or technology where we have to upgrade now right. to get ready for That's a computer-based test and things like that. So we're still investing and responding to those programs, and they are still costing us money that we're not getting from other sources. So we have to figure out a way to make that work, and this is one of the many ways that I but think we're But if we, we increased headcount, it would be even more difficult to Absolutely. get that funding into those other costs and have that direct benefit or more direct benefit anyway on the classrooms than it would, would otherwise be able to do. Yeah, there would be a cost on the other cost centers like regular and special education and things like that. All right. I've got to follow. Uh, this might not be for Alex, maybe anybody budget and Kelly or uh, Steve. Um, well, five percent of the total <coughs> budget. How does it? Do you have any sense of how that compares to like similar size districts or similarly positioned districts? Is that pretty standard? It's 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 pretty. I mean, it, it's it's. We're fairly close. We have to remember we're we're under the per student cost average, uh, right. and if I calculated that out, it'd be close to two million dollars that we're under. 
uh, as a district. Right. So and that's actually part of that's the genesis of my question. Is that from savings in areas like this or elsewhere? Well, all over. And, all and over. you know, one thing that, that this picture doesn't show and it can't show because if, if you're not in the operational aspect of the school district, you, 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 we, we talk about these things, but we don't expect you to remember them. Uh, through the past number of years, we, we've absorbed tasks that were done in schools because we had to cut funding. Uh, an example of that would be special education chairs. Uh, we took that responsibility on in, in central office and didn't uh, uh, create more staff. We, we absorbed that and it was a considerable amount of work to do so. Uh, we absorbed uh, ELL in terms of the administrative structure that used to be farmed out to, to staff, but uh, our ELL English uh, language learner population has increased and we didn't have the money to bring somebody in to service students in that area. So we took over the administrative tasks without hiring somebody. Uh, out of district uh, coordinator is another area where we have somebody working with us, uh, but that uh, as our population demographics change, the number of places that our students go out of district has increased dramatically because we have to find programs that, that have that critical mass for students that need those accommodations uh, to uh, be successful. Those are just a few things. Right. You know, I, I, I got to say, just during my informal survey of just, you know, other districts as I look at, you know, how they're organized and stuff there, I think we're very efficient on the number of people we have com covering the number of positions a central office needs to do uh, here. And then I think it goes back to what Kelly was just saying there is, is we got some people part-time covering what other districts may have full-time people doing or have farmed down to the, um, the lower levels of the pieces there. So i really impressed on how quite dense and efficient we're running our central office there. But I do recognize at some point we're going to stress that uh, more so than it already is stressed. Uh. And one more point on that. When we look at, when we compare with other districts and what they are doing with their central offices, uh, people categorize things in certain ways. So again, going back to the tech team four or five years ago, it was very much an, an administrative district-wide team that was focused on putting out fires, setting up infrastructure. Now, a lot of those uh, staff members are doing more of that regular and special education work and some professional development work. Uh, we had the full day professional development day uh, recently for the Tiger Tech Summit, and that was run um, in large part by the tech team. And so those those costs are coming out of this cost center, and another district would re could reasonably put them in a different cost center as well, either professional development or uh, regular education or special education. There's just different, there are a number of ways to, to skin a cat, and I think that when it comes to categorizing what central office is, if we were to consider the tech team as more regular education or partially regular education, which is a lot of the work they do, I think that we even see this number go down. So. The cost center go down, but not our yes. budget go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you still got to pay for it. Because exactly. it's going to just bring right. right. it to another squad. Shift it to a different cost yeah. center. That's yeah. all. Yeah. I just want to be yeah. careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. getting rid of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not getting rid of it. Nothing's for free. Exactly. Thank you. All right, great. Thank Thanks you, Alex. Um, let's just, we'll, I think the next two things we can quickly knock out in the new business and close that one out altogether. Uh, a format to be used for presenting financial information to the town. We uh, got a template from the uh, town financial admin team that we are putting data into, and we made a couple modifications. We're almost done with that, and what we will do is uh, submit it uh, back over to the town finance team, but we'll also, we'll all get it, and then we can have a discussion about it. Um, it'll probably happen at the next meeting. It'll be done prior to the next meeting, so we can and I'll likely have a discussion about that. It's it's just, a, as Alex said, it's just a different way to skin the cat. It's just, a, it, the numbers aren't changing. It's just a different way of looking at it. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I think it'll be interesting and, and, and uh, give us something to talk about. But uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and deal with that uh, as we finish that. Uh, and then, Kelly, under New Biz, we have upcoming presentations. Uh, yes, uh, just a, another comment. Three years ago, we developed cost centers to present our budget. Uh, what we found is, is without creating a unified uh, cost center approach to budgeting, it was very difficult when you were talking numbers with, with uh, 
other elected officials uh, for them to understand the context of the number. So we sat down and we created universal cost centers. So now that when, when we're talking about a number, <coughs> excuse me, it has meaning to it. it. It goes to a cost center and this is what it's for. Before our budget uh, was blended with the town and, and uh, depending on their chart of accounts determine what, what numbers were and sometimes those numbers were different from the numbers we were using because it included different things. So I think we've come a long way in, in creating, for lack of a better phrase, a universal language when we're talking about budgeting with, with the town and the community. And uh, It's a good thing, and, and, and I'd like to thank everybody at this table for working with our leadership team in, in making that happen. Uh, upcoming budget. Yeah, oh, uh, I draw another comment. Yeah, no, I, I, I want to um, compliment, you know, um, the... Um, you know the uh, budget subcommittee and the and the administration on working with the town on coming to closure and, and compromise so to speak on where where and how we're doing the budget pieces there I know it sometimes it could be at loggerheads this is the way we do our budget this is the way we need it presented and either side both sides thought they were right on it and I think we've made a lot of progress uh, in interboard in town harmony in terms of both sides being a lot more flexible on, on looking at how we're doing the information exchange and you know the uh, presentations. I think it's building a lot of uh, goodwill with the other boards uh, there in terms of just the working relationships. Uh, there it doesn't seem to be at loggerheads as it might have been in yeah, past years. Yeah, Kelly's point is right, and, and, and I think I can speak to it even better than Kelly can because I've been here even longer than he has. But ten years ago, it was totally different and not very meaningful or worthwhile. It got the job done, but it was rough it's a lot better so now when we have a discussion and maybe we have a difference of opinion it's about the content in the actual what we want to talk about which is funding of the education priorities in town and things like that rather than arguing about what are we arguing about that's what we used to do we used to argue about what we were arguing about now we're arguing about an actual point that needs to be made and it can happen and, I, and I, it's it's more worthwhile to have that type of discussion than just waste our both our time not just the school committees obviously but the you know the finance committee the selectmen but even more importantly it confused anybody who was trying to stay involved at town meeting or you know as, as a voter in, in, in town and I think that's helped you know that constituency as well so it's been worthwhile you know it was you know bumpy at times but we've gotten there pretty well and you know I think we're in a much better place for it so thanks a lot well, on the subject of that um, having sat through the FinCom meeting and I thought we did a a really good job of presenting what our budget was for this coming year and how we want what we haven't um, done a good job is visioning if we want to say like you know one of our plans is in I'm just gonna throw it out that you know in 2030 we want to do some fun full day kindergarten right we haven't presented that information to the town of what's coming up or what we expect to come up right um, and along the lines of their mission budgets and things right we need to do a better job of getting in front of them saying, you know, not for this year, but for next year or five years down the road, this is what we would like to do or this is what we foresee needing funds for, right? Um, so that they're more aware of it before, um, before they actually, before the dollars meet them. That's a good point. That's sort of like what we talked. I don't know if it was you or Daryl suggested doing that with the capital budget planning and keeping right. a, a and list and of things. And we, we did do something. We had the budget visioning meeting that Alex, you know, uh, championed, and, and we, we made at least a first step down that road. Um, you know, in, in it, I think that's a it's a legitimate point, but I think it's legitimate across <laughs> the town. I don't think as a town we've done a very good job, and I think it's been a probably an unfortunate acknowledgement of we know what our constraints are and we don't see an end to you know how difficult it is to f to keep our current staffing and service levels across the town going I think we've probably dropped the ball a little bit as a town to say well yeah we're probably not going to be able to do very much of it at all but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be having these discussions right. and as I always phrase it is so as long as we know why we're not doing what we're doing that that's as meaningful as is doing it so it's a good point and I, I think it might be something that when we have these joint meetings we can start to have a dialogue about that so that it becomes a town-wide discussion across all of the things that we want to do as a community yes. and not just specific to, to, to us yeah I agree with all of that I'm just saying we should have that wish list yeah. somewhere yeah. on the budget like we have for yeah. And right. for capital, yeah. as we do yeah. with the capital. And I think we have made some good strides towards that. The tricky thing is, and Mike just alluded to this, 
uh, at least since I've been on the on the committee, every budget cycle, we've been focused on trying to save what we already have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and certainly there are a number of things that each of us would I, I, I'm, yeah. yeah, I agree with all of that, but if you don't get the <coughs> wish list out, no one knows about the wish list. So yeah. Yeah. there should be the wish list somewhere, Yeah. right? And we can just keep putting the wish list out and never get anything off of right. it. But if no one knows about you the know, wish list, it, they'll think you're happy. Right. That might be a great thing to do, with because what happens typically with the budget subcommittee sort of annual cycle is, you know, we start in the fall, we work in, you know, reasonably hard on it. It picks up steam as we come through this part of the year, through town meeting, and then we all just breathe a collective sigh of relief. We got to cross right. the finish line and, and stop. And maybe we can use that time where we're kind of coming towards the end of our business year and at the beginning of, of the next bit year, school year, um, we can start to think about using that that opportunity, that time to, to take advantage of that, the, the right. ideas that you have there. I think that It also really prevents provide. surprises. Like if we've been pushing for I, like I said, full day kindergarten for a long time, right? And all of a sudden we put it in, they say, well, where'd that suddenly come mm -hmm. from? Well, it's been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've said yeah. it's really important now. No, that's an interesting thing to think about. And it's something that we that we do talk about at the budget technique level, but it is, we are focused, you're right, yeah. on what's in front of us and not what's five, ten years away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to be very careful of the, the terminology that we use. Uh, a, a mission budget by definition, educational definition, even research definition, uh, refers to what you need to uh, do your job as an organization. What do you need to meet the needs of students? A vision budget looks toward the future. What do we need to meet the needs of our students in the future? And when we're planning for the future, if we put items down, they need to be justified. They need to tie into our strategic plan. They need to tie into student learning. So I, I think we need to be very careful of the terminology that, that we use. Uh, my observation since I've been here, uh, I've dealt with a number of financial boards in my career, uh, it, it, it puts you in a very different spot when right off the, the bat you're trying to keep what you have. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really difficult to go into the vision budgeting process when you ex expend so much time and energy at justifying what you already have. So we need to turn that conversation around and, and we can do it, but you know, we, need to, we need to make that part of our budgeting process. I mean, uh, believe me, it wouldn't take long for, for me to sit down with you and come up with a vision plan in terms of what we need in the next 10 years. I'm doing this job for a number of years. Uh, but it has to have meaning and it has to fit into a plan and it has to be affordable. I mean, that's the, that's the key in any community that, that you have a, a publicly funded budget. You can't tip that balance. And who knows what the balance is? You know when you've tipped it. But you have to be very cautious and, and be cognizant of what everybody else needs in this town. We all want the best services for this town that we can provide. And, and I always caution because if you get into a scenario where your <coughs> vision budget is not reachable and not defendable, it loses its purpose. Uh, uh, just a caution. And, and if we put numbers down uh, in terms of vision, it, it means that we really believe that we need to go in that direction to meet the needs of our students in the future. Yeah, I, I think this is a, you know, a, a, an ongoing conversation with the Board of Selectmen. I mean, even just the, you know, the um, the agreement to allow us to submit a required a required services budget so that we could not use the concept of level staffing, which doesn't work when we have required staffing people that we have to deliver uh, or the mission budget which again I think means has a very specific meaning as you outlined there which is not necessarily what you would like to offer for services to your students right uh, type of thing there so I think we still have some work to do in terms of what type of terminology that we're using there so that it, it has the right meaning uh, on it because I think we're get, getting closer but I don't think we're still there with the town we have this conversation feels like all the time about mission budget terminology um, but Which we did it two years ago oh really well we had the conversations but using those terminology right. I think at least for me I'm more on board with it than I was two years ago and so I think we are making progress sorry to get you off no it's okay I was gonna say Ke Kelly you brought up a good point which like you dovetailed from what uh, Daryl and Mark said but we I do think that might be a worthwhile um, activity to go through and 
fund, uh, pr project the funding for our strategic plan and what we need. So it's not wish list items, but one of the hard, you know, one of the things that every community, every board has when you're talking about a strategic plan is having it actually influence your activities moving forward mm -hmm. and sticking with it. And so it's kind of, um, it seems sort of like uh, a, fu a futile effort to write a strategic plan if we are not on track to meet the goals of the strategic plan with the funding that we're given. And so it may be worthwhile taking the time to say, project five or 10 years down the line saying, this, these aren't wish lists, you know, we're not saying we want, you know, flat screen TVs in every room for the sake of doing it, but if we are to meet the strategic plan that the school committee has put together, right. we're projecting that we're missing it by this much, this much, and this much. And then to Mark's point, people know <coughs> when we settle on the budget each year, people know that we got X amount, but the things that we missed <coughs> are Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Uh, it, we, sh we should be doing that, no, no doubt in my mind. Uh, it is important to know <coughs> that, that we are meeting our, our mission uh, right. and our strategic plan with, with the budget that we have. It's stretched, but we are meeting the needs of our students. Uh, mm -hmm. Believe me, you would be hearing from me much more <laughs> in that area if we weren't. Uh, so, but it is a, it is a struggle. And there, there are naturally things that we would like to do that we can't. And uh, we need to keep the eye on the ball because uh, it may, down the road, influence our ability to do our uh, to <coughs> accomplish our mission. So uh, I think we, we do need to do that exercise. All right, good. Uh, as we, we move on, uh, DCAP, another nice acronym, uh, District Comprehensive Accommodation Plan. That's what it's called, or curriculum yeah. plan, sorry. Uh, Every district, by law, uh, has a DCAP plan, and we've revised ours, and we've done it in a way that uh, creates greater meaning to it. And what is it? It, it outlines uh, instructional strategies that teachers use when students are struggling in the classroom prior to them being recommended for testing to be placed on an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. And uh, we've had one in the district for many years, but uh, we needed to review it. We had a comprehensive program review by Depart by, done by the Department of Education two years ago. And uh, we reviewed the plan with them at that time, one of many things we reviewed. But we felt as a leadership team that, that we needed to make sure that our staffs were, were fully committed and fully understood that it needs to be actualized. So we created a process last year where we sat down with our staffs and uh, went over our old plan and developed a plan according to uh, strategies that we currently use in our classrooms. So we have a district plan that we've uh, finalized and finished, uh, worked through it with our, our local uh, educational association. So we'll be uh, presenting that to you uh, at our next meeting. Nice to have that done and, and uh, also nice to, to know that uh, our teachers are using a lot of, uh, and I no doubt in my mind, are using a lot of uh, various strategies to meet the needs of students in their classrooms prior to recommending them to be placed or tested uh, to be placed on an IEP. Accountability presentation, the state as you know, uh, no child left behind when we went into the waiver process. Now we have something new, Every Child Succeeds Act. The Can Succeed Act, uh, we, we want to do a presentation on our accountability levels with you. Uh, as we move forward, as you know, they have MCAS 2.0. What does that mean as we move forward? Uh, quite simply, if we, and we, uh, we've already opted to take MCAS this year, we're still subject to accountability status. Those districts that uh, have enrolled in the other exam called PARC uh, are exempt from accountability status. And you also realize that the MCAS will also have PARC questions on the MCAS exam for this year. So it's a little convoluted and, and actually hard for us to understand at the leadership team level. But it'll all iron out in the next few years and we will have one universal exam across the state uh, called MCAS 2.0 and it will be an online testing uh, format for our students. So uh, again, we'll, we'll be uh, having a, a presentation uh, strictly on, accommodate, or on accountability uh, down the road. One thing I, I wanted to mention before we move on uh, very quickly, the high school uh, administration and, and myself have been working with Middlesex Community College on a partnership. Uh, we're uh, very, very close to be bringing it back to you for a presentation. Some very exciting opportunities for our students and staff. 
Uh, we're hoping uh, with your blessing when we have, have what are the direction that we're setting, uh, able to present to you, we can uh, start rolling it out in the fall of next year and, and hopefully in the summer of this year as well. So it, it's, it's so exciting. I don't want to disclose anything at this point in time because I need to sit down with the high school teachers yet, in all fairness to them. Uh, I don't want them uh, sitting at home stressing out if I start talking about it right now. But uh, it, it's an incredible opportunity for our kids. It, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and all I can say is Middlesex College uh, is looking toward the future. It, it's, it's really impressive. So. And I'll are leave it at that. Are we doing a promo for the next meeting or something? Oh, this is a teaser. For oh, yeah. That's a teaser. <laughs> cliffhanger. <laughs> to get more people in the audience exactly. here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, good discussion. Hello. Put us 10 minutes behind schedule. All right. That's okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about school start times. And uh, I just want to put a, a clarification on, on the, the way it's phrased on the agenda. So we're going to have two discussions. And I want to do it as two distinct discussions. We're going to have a first one about school year start dates, and then we'll have one about school day start times, not school year start times, um, school day start times. And what I would like to do is we'll have a discussion up here and then about school year start dates. And then if anybody wants to have some, some comments about school year start dates, great. And then once we've you know reached some kind of resolution for tonight's discussion, We'll segue into the school day start times. We'll talk about it. And again, if anybody wants to come up and, and talk about school day start times, they can do that as well. Question yes. about procedure. I don't want to screw up the plan too much, but is there a logic for why we would talk about it before we hear from what the people in the community have to say? So the, it's a good, good point of clarification. We are not making any decisions tonight. Yeah. Maybe I should have prefaced that. We are not making any decisions tonight about either one. I think what we more would like to do is talk about what's the best process for soliciting input, getting evaluation from you know our admin team, and you know soliciting input from the community, and then making some determinations about what we think is best for the Littleton Public School District and the students and families in terms of these two particular things, the school year start dates and the school day start times. So tonight's going to be more about a discussion of process, what needs to be talked about, you know, framing it a little bit, and then and then we will and also make a determination about how fast we want to go, how we want to do it, and, and things like that. Okay, that all right? Yep. All right, good. All right, so let's just start talking initially about school year start dates. Uh, typically, historically, we've always started after Labor Day. We did this year start before Labor Day because we made a determination that we felt that Labor Day was so late in the calendar, it was as late as it could be, that we thought it maybe would be beneficial to uh, try starting before Labor Day for the first time. We seem to have survived that to one degree or another. Whether or not people liked it or not is certainly you know part of the, of the process to evaluate it. Kelly, do you have any comments before we, we talk about it as a, as a school um, committee? Yeah, it, uh, I think it worked out really well, and, and I received a lot of positive feedback. You're never going to get everybody liking something different. Right? And we get used to routines. and. and it takes a while to adjust, but uh, I guess from my point of view, I really enjoyed the fact that we had some flexibility, and I know that flexibility isn't going to exist very much because of the way the calendar year works to, from year to year, but uh, we do have union considerations as we, we have this discussion that, that we need to be mindful of in terms of contractual language. Uh, I mean, the, the, the important thing when we, we talk about uh, school year start times is, is obviously what comes to the forefront uh, snow days and, and what does that mean at, at the back end of the school year in June and I think that's a, a, a good component to the conversation that, that we really need to, to have. Uh, it, it really depends on what you're used to. Uh, we have 180 compulsory days in, in Massachusetts uh, we build in five snow days. Uh, other areas have 196 compulsory days. Uh, so uh, there isn't a discussion about how close to the end of June that you go. You're close, no matter what. And most states say that you can't go beyond July 1st. So there, there are some parameters. Uh, Massachusetts uh, doesn't uh, look at time on learning in minutes. They view it in days. So that creates less flexibility as a result of that. So uh, I think as we, we, we talk about uh, this as a school committee and as a community, 
uh, we need to be mindful that, that, uh, that Labor Day changes from year to year, and we want to make sure if we do something differently that uh, it's going to uh, meet the needs of what we're trying to accomplish long term. Alex, any thoughts on school year start date? Sure. So I think this past cycle, Labor Day was on the 9th, uh, and that was, as, uh, as you guys said, as late as it could get. Um, no, 7th. It can't be later than the 7th. That's right. The Sorry, 7th. That's <laughs> right. I'm looking at, we started on the 9th. Right. That's Correct. Where that right. That's where the number was coming from. Right, right, right. The Labor Day was on the 7th. We started right. on the 9th. Right. Uh, and then, of course, we need that day before the start of school for staff to get uh, to get in and for new staff as well. Um, I don't think, as Kelly said, that you're ever going to make anyone 100% happy. Uh, I think what, I think this year and this situation worked well. I'm not sure what will work well in different cycles. What I think would be good if we could come to some understanding on was if we could plan out years in advance, and thankfully the calendar is already set. So unlike our standardized testing where we're not going to know before we take it what's, go what's on the test, the calendar is laid out in front of us at the end of time. So with that in mind, if whatever we agree on, if we can say we might make some changes to this, but you could expect over the next couple of years for us to generally follow this pattern, and maybe it is if Labor Day falls on a fifth, sixth, or seventh, then we start before, and then uh, if it starts earlier, then we'll start after, or something like that. If we had some sort of rule of thumb that we would use every year, that would give people, I think, a little more stability and a little more reliability in terms of their summers, their calendars, camp sessions, things like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the type of thing where I don't have a tremendous uh, <coughs> opinion either way except for what we get with respect to feedback um, you know like it, it doesn't really in fact it's not gonna have a huge outcome on student learning it's really a lifestyle kind of thing I personally feel like um, we I think we did something I, I think we managed it the best we could this year I suspect that people probably don't love the idea. We sort of tried to shoot the middle as best we can by doing a long weekend around Labor Day. I suspect that if I had kids that it would probably be better to either do one or the other and like Alex said, give people long enough notice that if they have vacations planned, it doesn't screw that up. But I feel like doing the, you know, like middle of the road thing probably was the best we could do to mitigate the impact this year, but probably going forward, I would suspect it's better to go one way or another. Um, I would want to also hear, I don't think we heard as much from students. Last year we didn't have a student rep when we discussed this. Now we do, so I'd be curious if Olivia could um, get a, an idea of how this has impacted students directly rather than just parents. But obviously parents are um, pretty important in this as well. Um, and then I, I personally have of uh, my opinion, if it, this was still affecting me in my daily life, would be that the Labor Day start date is a traditional thing, but it's pretty arbitrary when you actually think about how things happen on the ground. And if we can align, to me something that would be more constructive would be aligning with other districts and other educational institutions like colleges and universities because um, I think we have, it's mismatched right now. Colleges tend to tar start the school year earlier than us and they end the school year earlier than us. So when you're talking about babysitting and athletic, you know, cooperations and stuff like that, it's probably more difficult to have um, the start dates sort of off kilt like that. Um, again, yeah, again, I, I don't have a huge stake in it, absent getting feedback, but I think that pro people are probably pretty happy with the way that we did it this year. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, you know, what, I, especially with Labor Day late this year, I like the way we did it this year, and I would probably look towards the whole calendar, and, and I was trying to figure out is there a rule it, isn't quite figured out yet, but it's probably the Wednesday before Labor Day or September 1st, because September 1st drives our, is our contract date. Right. Right. All right. So this year, the Wednesday before algorithm worked, you'd have to look at, right. you know, is that really how you state the algorithm uh, kind of thing there? And then the purpose of that being, it could then also set up the discussion with our bargaining units later that is this something we'd want to adopt, it dropped the September 1st part of that Wednesday before Labor Day piece there because I'm concerned about two, you, you know, that, that extension into June, I think because all the standardized testing is done, no matter how late we start running, 
uh, there. You know, they don't push the standardized testing to the last week of school, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which would make the most sense from students being prepared for uh, the uh, pieces there. So the more days we lose, the less prepared the students are for um, the, you know, all of the things. And, and it's not just the state level standardized testing. We see our AP classes doing quite a push to make sure they cover the material right. uh, during those uh, pieces there uh, on it. Um, and then at some point, but I don't think we can do it as an island, is the New England tradition of two vacations. Uh, I, I, I agree with what I've seen on the MESC mailing list that I don't think one community can do it right. in, as an island. It, it doesn't work uh, there. At some level, is, is there trying to, to get broader um, advocacy amongst all of the school committees to make a more unified decision about whether we drop the dual vacations as a, as a you know, I, I don't know if that becomes some kind of low level thing that we start talking about at the uh, district level at MASC district meetings kind of thing, which we don't traditionally participate in. I, you know, I, I don't know how we start getting some larger consensus about what do we do about the dual vacation, two week vacation uh, there because uh, again that's, that affects, um, you know, that and like I said it's a New England tradition, it's not a nation, a national type of activity. It's not even entirely a New England tradition because I know my uh, uh, relatives in Connecticut, they don't take two full weeks. Yeah. Right. So. And that's an interesting thing. We we sort of brought that up at the end of the conversation last year. We said we'd talk about it again. That would be the type of thing where I would love to get more feedback from because I I agree, Daryl, that it would be ideal if we could get you know have an MASC conversation, have everyone switch three years from now. Um, I don't think it would be a huge problem for us to do it if we if we have the pop, if, you know people in the town are saying we're ready for that, especially when colleges and universities again tend to have a spring break that's not the same as our breaks especially people, people in college and in high school, that can be difficult. So I, we should talk about that, and, and that should be a part, Mike, for the when we're getting feedback, that should be included, because we shouldn't be talking about this in a vacuum, because the days, when you're talking about extended the school year, that'll be affected by whether or not we have two week long vacations. So I'm from Ohio. We always started Tuesday before Labor Day. <laughs> right. If you want to know the rule, that was the rule. <laughs> now they changed the rule. <laughs> <laughs> some of the districts, and they started a couple weeks before Labor Day. Um, but I never understood why we start so late here. And it actually it made a lot of sense because the first week of school, you really didn't accomplish that much. By the time you got around and introduced, getting back and into the swing of things, you actually started school for real, right? When you got back from Labor Day, so it made a lot more sense to me. And I don't know why the New England tradition of starting so late um, up here. Um, didn't make sense to me because also we didn't go to school until the end of June. Um, so we didn't have the two vacations. <coughs> you were done right after, usually the week after Labor Day was when everything was finished. So Memorial, Memorial Day. Memorial Day. Memorial, Memorial Day. Sorry. It's a long yeah. school year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, much, that much of a break. <laughs> um, and I agree, it can't be done in a vacuum. Um, I did have a question, though, when you said the feedback was generally positive, was that from staff or parents or students or all of the above? Uh, all of the above. And, and again, I, I, I want to be cautious when I make those statements, uh, and we need to talk about process. If, if we're going to do this, uh, we need to come up with a, a process that uh, allows us to get good information from the community, the school community, right. so that we're not, you know, uh, for example, if, if we have a forum, we may have 20 people show up. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot more people in our school community than that, and we really want a good cross-section of what people think. And, and then I, I have to go into student voice. This is a great opportunity for us to look at stu school count or student councils more correctly and uh, ask them to help us with this and come back and make presentations to us after they survey the student body. I mean, we'll help them make the presentations so that they're, they re they're reliable and, and, and valid in terms of the questions. But I think this is a great exercise in, in student government as well. I, to I totally agree that this couldn't be a better thing for students to discuss because it, I'm sure they have a huge opinion on it. And you might, I don't know why you're laughing, it seems like <laughs> <There's> <laughs> she's the probably ready to talk. Both, like, both of the topics that are being discussed as of right now, there's been so much talk, so many different opinions. 
personally, like my friends have jumped back and forth multiple times given what's come up. I think the general consensus that I can say is everyone hates being in school at the end of June. It's hot, we're all miserable, and we have to sit there and take finals. Um, and realistically, at the high school, there's around two to four days of what you were saying, like reacclimation and the district determined measures and like student teacher contracts, which was nice because we had those two days to get all that information, went home for a four day weekend, and then came back and we, in most of the classes, started learning. Um, I'm not sure that people, at least the students wise, would be happy giving up two breaks, um, <laughs> or giving up a break in general. Um, I think a lot of that, though, is for a lot of classes, we're getting homework over break anyway. So if it was, we're not going to have a, this break, but you're not going to have this huge project due when the equivalent of getting back would be, I think students would be okay with that. I agree with you. 16 year old Mike Mazzoni hates what I said a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> 16 year old Mike Mazzoni would have had a longer summer where they can't assign any homework. Oh. Alex didn't do his summer reading. <laughs> I, I'd also like to add that the AP class students are at a tremendous disadvantage, and I know that there were classes last year that were talking about meeting over breaks and over weekends to try and catch up um, from days that they missed because or, start or because of the late start. So starting earlier gives them that much extra time. I have a question for Olivia, if we, if we can entertain it. Do you feel like the um, having the two days before and then having the long break, was that worth it? Was that worth having that extra break? I think it was nice. I think that I'm on the more flexible side. Um, like, at least for my family, it's, it's the needing to know what you guys have talked about is like, saying early on, this is what we're going to do this year. So with notice, if you, as long as you notice, have notice. like, if it, the parents are, because this came up, some kids missed the first day or two because it's Labor Day weekend, it's my last chance to get away. But a lot of families are back because there's back to school shopping, there's everything before school starts. And with the AP, my homeroom is um, the AP Euros teachers classroom and they have a countdown on the whiteboard how many days they have until the AP exam. And they have like how many regular days and then how many school days and the school days because of the breaks is I want to say around 20 days less. I will also say on the other side of the AP, after the AP exams, it's very hard to get the students to do anything in the AP classes when they still have six weeks of class left or whatever and no AP exam coming up and no final coming up. What are you going to get them to do? But just another comment, Mark. You know, when we, we, we bring as much context into this as we can. You always have to remember, what is, what is the next adventure or venture our students are going into? If you go to a typical public university, you're going to be taking that same course with higher expectations in less time. So, you know, I, I guess that's why it's so important that we, we take the time to really explore what we're doing here. Those students that took the nanotechnology course, uh, it was a pretty high caliber course, uh, I would probably say as hard, as hard as any AP or harder, and they had less time to complete it. So, you know, part of our job in, in, in education, in public education, is to make sure that our students are prepared for the next part of their journey. And, and we can't ignore those expectations either. Well, it's going to be a real interesting conversation as we, we try to figure out what the best thing is to do for Littleton. So if I can add um, one last thing. Um, Alex and I, we, it, the year goes by so quickly and we've talked for literally I think our first meeting back from the summer about going in and getting some time with the student leaders and anybody who wants to show up to talk about some things we have going on 
and I don't know what you think, Olivia, but this seems like the perfect conversation where we could, if Alex and I or in any of our other colleagues wanted to come in and meet with student council and stuff like that, this would probably be a topic that would probably get some, I, I would think, think, interest from students. Do you? Yeah, I think so. I think you'd have to figure out because there's um, student council and then there's also um, the other four students that right. are in like basically to fill in for me right. the times that I can't come. I think they have separate meetings on the sides, yeah. but they all asked me like how the meetings went and like what got discussed. So I think, I think like you said, a lot of students would be interested in that because students my age, at this point, we don't really have any problem sharing our opinions <laughs> with adults. Um, well, I'd be, I'd be, I mean, I'd, maybe we can ask your help in helping to facilitate that with John or with Principal Arrington. Yeah. But um, I would say the more the merrier, probably, if yeah. we could get both groups together. Or we could do an open forum. Yeah, with anybody where, where anyone, sure. any student who wants to spend time after school talking about school can do so. Let's, get, let's hold off on that for a second because I think that we're going to circle back towards the process. Um, and I just want to get a couple comments in and then, and then let anybody who, in the audience who wants to come up and speak do that. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate what Alex said. I thought that the idea, and this is kind of, we've talked around it, and, and Alex was more specific about it, but the whole concept of a coming up with a policy and then implementing it so that people can plan around it, I think is important. Um, and, and then in terms of feedback, it, it's important, but we've already had a lot of feedback about this, not just specific to uh, this effort in terms of determining what the start date was going to be for this year, but we did a calendar, a whole calendar thing that talked about a lot of things, and the whole Labor Day thing was one of the prominent things. And what it clearly became clear to me was some people hate it and some people love it. And it, just you're not going to get a consensus, and it's not worth exhausting ourselves to try. So at that point, it com what comes down to me is, and what Kelly talked about at the beginning of the discussion was, what's going to be the most impactful, positive impactful decision to make relative to the school, the schools and, and, the, and the students. Um, so what I think we, when, we, when we try to come up to a final decision about this, I think we need to be cognizant of that needs to be the driver, not are we going to make people happy or unhappy. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to win it in terms of consensus. And that's okay. I mean, that's perfectly okay. Um, so those are just my two thoughts about that, is, is coming up with a, some type of specific uh, uh, policy that people can plan around and just being careful that the decision we make is based on what's educationally correct rather than worrying about, you know, traditions and vacations and things like that. Um, I don't want to dismiss them out of hand, but it, you almost have to because some people are going to say, I want to get to my camp in June. I don't care about Labor Day as much. And people are going to say, I love Labor Day. That's my one. i got to have it. So we're not going to win that one too much. I agree. I totally agree with you on that last part. But to be fair, the feedback that we got last year was overwhelmingly one-sided. So you're not, you may not get a consensus. But when we, we say that we'll never gonna, right. we're never going to make everyone happy, right. but we, based on the feedback But you've got to be careful to Kelly's yeah, point because that was limited feedback. Of course. When we did a broader effort, the, that consensus was not there, as I remember it anyway. And I'm perfectly happy to do it again. And if I'm wrong, perfect one. That, that makes it easy. Right. Believe me, if there's consensus, it's easy. It's much easier. As long as we're not consensus. making a decision. No, right. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the words consensus. Okay. Because right. you you won't get consensus right. with anything. Um, and I think you, we brought up some great points about process in terms of student councils. We might very well want to think about the school improvement councils because there's, there's a good broad cross section of community and and admin and teachers and things like that. Um, and then obviously we did talk about uh, you know with our bargaining partner with the LEA. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but I would at this time, if anybody has any specific comments in the audience, I'd like to come up to the podium to talk about regarding school year start date. Now is your time. Come on. Go, go. You can go first. I'm always talking. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, just use the microphone and just name and uh, street, just so we know we can identify in the minutes who we were listening and talking with. That'd be great. Glenn Barry, Chris Mill Road. Uh, I guess I just echo uh, Daryl's comments. Um, I think starting early, you know, helps the kids in terms of all the standardized tests because they don't change. And I know uh, my wife was a high school teacher for 20 years, and she also uh, would would recommend that 
you know, it's much easier to teach a student in late August, early September when it's warm versus trying to teach that same student in mid-June when it's warm. Um, you just get their attention more at the beginning of the year, no matter what the temperature is. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Who else? <coughs> Lisa Boone. Um, I have a few comments. One, I will definitely agree with, um, I think the earlier start time, um, as far as the date goes, can be very advantageous. I know there's a lot of people who push back on that, but it depends on the age level you're looking at, where you're going to get that feedback from. The higher grade you are, especially high school, all the sports have already started. <coughs> Families are not going away on vacation at that time. They're, they're there because of these commitments. So, um, and you definitely have the first few days of just reacclimating. It doesn't matter what age you are. So it's not, it takes some time. So if you wait till after Labor Day, you have to take that first week and assume you're not getting much done except acclimating, getting everything set. Know that you're starting the, the week after Labor Day period so that you just have to accept that and whatever you decide um, I actually like the idea Alex had brought up about maybe using um, when Labor Day falls to help determine that if you really want to look at how long you're going into the year I think having had high school students in AP classes it is a huge burden and I know that's just one piece of our community in the school district but it is significant and it's huge when they take those exams they really it is difficult getting them to do something I know one of my students you know the teacher tried to create a project that they did that was somewhat interesting and to try to keep them engaged because they still had to go to the class you know there was there was a time that was already set and so it's it's actually more significant than you may imagine um, especially as our students are taking more and more of these AP classes the stress of being prepared for that test and the amount of extra time that they're forced to put in that are not in school hours and the teachers are doing this too we have to really we're, we're focusing on students and families the teachers are significant pieces I think they're the ones that you have to get the most feedback from as well you have to really consider that um, when you're making some of these decisions um, as well as the families because um, they're they're important to this you know decision the second thing I want to talk about is the whole vacation idea <laughs> I have a very strong opinion about that but I think that it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing around us I think we have to make that decision based on what makes sense and what's right not just for our community but what's right for the school and again the entire community not just students but teachers so I think if you talk to a lot of the students and families you're going to get such a variation depending on the age if you are an upper level student you've got a lot of work no matter whether it's vacation or not you have sports games you have you know th those don't end you have basketball over Christmas you have indoor track over Christmas you, you have hockey over Christmas Th those families aren't going anywhere you know same thing with February vacation there's still those commitments so a lot of those families aren't traveling and now they target us in this area you can't go away because it costs so much mm -hmm. there's no way you're flying to something warm with a family you know it's a significant um, you know amount of money that they've now imposed on us because of this tradition that doesn't follow around the rest of the country so you you may find a lot of families will say oh I love the break or you may find and some of the teachers had said it's a great opportunity to clear the school of sickness you know so those are some of the things that might come into play that you're not recognizing or necessarily come to the for forefront of your mind um, really taking into consideration how it affects the whole community whether or not it's good to clean the school of germs or or give everybody a break or not you know maybe you move to no vacation and do long weekends you know how many families complain about all the days off we have and no stability with routine you, you know it's it really we have to start thinking outside the box and stop thinking about the tradition and really what people use this time for it, whether or not it's appropriate to really keep doing this just because this is what everybody else does you know I, I do think it's terribly important and so you know and younger kid families 
they're going to go on vacation, whatever they want. They have no problem pulling their children out of school. But the older they get, the more important it is that they don't miss school when it's scheduled. And the, the teachers and the administrators really push that on families starting around, I want to say, as early as third grade. Once you're in Russell Street, they start trying to impose that on families. It's not as strict. You hit middle school, you don't want to miss school. If there's scheduled school, you're, you're in trouble when you have to try to make up the work. Those students are struggling with that. So having time off isn't necessarily um, as meaningful when there's homework, when there's you know games and all this other stuff. Families are still restricted. Families are working. Parents are working. Kids are home anyway, doing a break, having a break and doing their work whenever. So I do think we have to be more willing to not be so worried about what everybody else is doing and what traditionally has happened and really take a step back and think about what makes sense given our, um, in order to meet the needs of, of what our community is looking at and, and, and make it be better, you know, than what it is. See if we can find a way to improve it. Because who knows, if everybody may say, wow, Littleton just, you know, figured something out that we never really thought about and look at what a great job you know, how well it's working, so don't be hindered by that. Thanks. I have a couple of comments on that. If mm -hmm. you know sure, me. good. Um, so if the sports, a lot of my friends do sports because it's a big part of um, Littleton Public Schools. They're normally in Littleton because they have preseason training and stuff like that at least a week, sometimes a couple of weeks before school even starts. Um, then the cleaning, taking a break to clean the school of germs. I have friends and I know other students who are so anxious when they're sick that they're coming to school anyway because of the stress of missing the work. Because you miss a day, it's missing so much material. Even if you're having, you're getting a copy of your friend's notes, especially when you're coming up to exams or like a big unit test and then with the random days I think my grade counted it was three weeks into school before we had a full week where we were there Monday to Friday no half days no assemblies no nothing very good thank you anybody else in the audience Any comments on school start date all right, thank you. Um, I just want to lead out, let's just talk about process a little bit. Um, I think it's important to, to, to broaden the reach of feedback. We talked about that. And I, we talked about school councils. I mentioned school improvement councils in talking to the LEA. Um, what I would like to do is charge the administration with coming up with a plan for getting that feedback specific to school start date school year start date um, and coming back to us with, with, with you know what you think is a, a good way to go about that that we can then comment on and, and make amendments to if we think it's appropriate and then we can talk about the timeline for execution of that plan um, and then we'll go get that feedback and, and then we can use that to frame the discussion and try to make a determination any comments or thoughts about that are you suggesting separating the start date from the rest of the school calendar like multiple vacations or at the moment one? I am because that's specifically and we, we started talking about the school vacations which is fine and I, it was it was a good discussion to have what I found in as we've talked about these things several times over the years that I've been involved here is the, the school year start date which is what we're talking about tonight is one thing and it, it naturally lends itself into concepts like, you know, streamlining vacations. And I think somebody mentioned long weekends instead of any vacation, which is something I've contemplated and tried to model a little bit. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so I, it's normal for that to happen. But I would like us to lock down the school year start date based on our current calendar framework and just put that one to rest. And then if we want, and I think we should, go ahead and have another discussion about G. What else will we, what we, 
what might we like to do and what are the impacts both in terms of the impact on teaching and learning but also budget wise or, or other things like that what opportunities we have and we at least had some good ideas about that so I'd like to just go ahead and just talk about the school year start date as a fairly focused let's get this done lock it down and then we, if we want to keep going we, we can <coughs> just one comment as I look at this year's calendar um, there's not really going to be any options, uh, you know, because our contract says we right. can't start before then. So we're starting after Labor Day because our contract won't allow anything else just because of the way right. Labor Day Because we're falls. cycling back to an early, very early Exactly. Day. So I think yeah. the framework of the, of, the question, of the survey or feedback needs to be is as we plan towards the future. Sure. Not yeah. this year because if, right. if we focus on the wrong question, we'll right. get the wrong That's a great point. The wrong answer. You're right. I uh, want, right. The discussion should be about, in general, school year start date, not specific to this year or right. even next year. But, and, and that's to Alex's point. That's, let's come up with a feedback on what we think is the right policy relative to the school year start date, and then we can, we can think about um, you know, how we want to deal with, with the feedback that we get. But that's a great point. Yeah. It's, well, it's not question. this year. Yes, Lisa? Sorry, I don't mean to yeah. Just to have you thinking along these lines, I know you want to do that separately, but if people are always thinking about when they end in June, if you change the way the calendar is and the vacations, you think about how that trickles out into when you end. So just keep in mind that we can focus on just the date, start date, and recognize when you'll end based on what's currently there. But if you start playing around with how you want to structure vacations and such, that will affect essentially. But maybe not if you make all the long weekends. And I agree with you. I think I think what days. would right. I see your point. I think what would happen is if we did rejigger the calendar. The normal, the natural extension of that would come back around to start date. So we may very well talk about start date twice. Okay. My concern is, and, and the reason I would like to focus on the start date specifically a little bit, is that if we want to blow up the calendar, that's going to take a while. The, even coming up with a good idea could take a year or more. And then thinking about the implementation could take a minute. So we're going to be two or three years conceivably down the road. I don't think that anybody's going to argue that we're going to go headlong into something like that and say, oh, well, let's just blow it up and see what happens. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be wonderful, you know. No, so, I, I, you're right. I mean, we may end up kind of yeah. going around this again, but, but it'll be for the right the reason. The start yeah. date has a contractual implication, right. though, whereas the how we schedule vacations, because our, our teacher's contract is 180, day, 180 teaching days. Within a certain frame. It doesn't frame. reference right. Right. any specific vacations within it. Right. But we can't do anything about the start date just because well, of the way to September 1st right, right. And unless we want to unless we want to go and bargain it but I mean that's right. but we wouldn't do that unless that was the desire of the community also Correct. you, you Correct. know in terms of where we want Correct. to end up so are we, we proposing sorry to interrupt. so are we proposing to set a 2016 start date no and a no, no, conversation no no no, no 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 I'm proposing that we come up with a policy yeah. on when we start the school year date yeah what the school year start date is yeah. relative to the current calendar we typically use. Yeah. So the That's idea would be in perpetuity you would look at this policy and know every year going forward. In perpetuity end. until something else changed right. and made it made right. you have to reevaluate it again whether it was in so the calendar. So our typical plan in the, uh, uh, this year being the exception the plan was always we started the Wednesday after Labor Day. Correct. Right. We always knew now that. Now we're yeah. saying we had hit the exception this year, and the question is, what do we want to do? Right. Do we make forward? it? Do we do it on an exception basis? Do we do it always right. before? Do we do it always after? And forget the exception. We right. just always do it. Right. Those right. are there kind three, of the, the three agree. choices. Right. There are three choices. You start before, you start after, or you have some type of plan depending on when Labor Day falls. Exactly. Right. I mean, we really need to keep this as as uh, well defined as we can. If it get, if it becomes too convoluted. You're gonna, you're gonna. I hate using this terminology, but you're gonna move from what transactional change to transformational change. If you want to be successful at this, you need to stick at transactional change. And if you add too much to the plate, it, it, it's it's culture changing. Right. And and we want to we want to make sure that we're we're thoughtful, and methodical, right. and and if we come to a decision on this. Uh, Maybe three years down the road we'll revisit it and we'll be ready for that next step. But I, I think we, we need to 
to chunk this for lack of a better word. I, I totally agree, but it's so, and I don't want to rush into anything either, but so I, I think in essence, so if we're deciding to only tackle, if we're, if we're talking about creating a policy that's forward looking just with the start date, then that means essentially that we're putting the conversation about vacations, et cetera, on the back burner for the long term. Not the long term. Because no, not at all. The discussion, no, the discuss the implementation, implementation will go on, on to and I wouldn't I don't think back burner is the right word to use. The implementation. We could start talking about the whole calendar five minutes after we come up with a decision on when we want to start the school year day relative to the current calendar. Five minutes after that. We can go ahead. I have no problem with that. But that discussion will take so much longer right. and be so much more encompassing and be transformational, as Kelly right. just talked about, that we won't get to the end of that process for a long time. And we may be gone right. in some <laughs> capacity or other. You know, some, <laughs> some frame, you know, we could get other people could get involved in that. You know what I mean? That's a big one. Right. And, and, and we may make a determination that we can't even do, we, we don't even think it's the right thing to do as Littleton. Lisa might disagree, but there might be reasons why we say, you know what, we need to think about doing it relative to an MASC effort, or something along those lines. That's going to be a much more difficult and, and twisty, turny path to oh, I traverse no down than simply coming up with a solid policy relative to school year. I, my point is just, and I, it's going to be forever, and it's, it'd be an ambitious task to undertake, but to Kelly's point, to set a goal of having the start dates be this way for the near future, and then to start a conversation, which is very likely going to impl is going to affect the start date in the near future, to me, I don't know, does that... I, I, I don't have a problem. I, I, think I, I, I think I, I don't, I, because it's probably the right way to do it. Right. But then, then, so then the other thing I would just say is that the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we had this exact same conversation last year and didn't move, never had the conversation about the vacation. So I'm comfortable well, with we it. we had it. We, we, it was talked about. It was brought up. This isn't the first time we've talked in this forum about should we have one, two, or no vacations in, in the winter. We've talked about it. We haven't talked about it in depth, and we haven't driven, come up with a process for really making a determination about what we think is the right thing to do, but it's been brought up. So um, I think I think it does make sense to set the start date and to have some predictability and consistency going forward, um, as long as we don't lose sight. Of I agree. And, and I, at I, the I, expense of having a broad. I agree 100 percent. I agree 100 percent. I guess I'm I'm a little torn. I was not going to say it, but I think you know. I would propose, I would like to see propose. I don't know uh, there that the end answer. A possible end answer is is we start the Wednesday before Labor Day. That is our policy, right? And and it's, and then we just lay that into the calendar. Right now we have a contractual constraint that doesn't allow us to state a crisp policy like right. that. Right. It's, it, you know, we, the best we can do is lay the calendar out and just manually mark these are the planned start dates for the next five years. Right. We and that's not a policy. That's a that's a that's just well, the policy would be to start the Wednesday before Labor Day unless we're contractually constricted from doing so. Yeah, Daryl's point was just to actually hit it on each yeah. calendar going forward. But yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Which makes yeah. the rules even right. more complicated than that. Well, my point is, is that if you set the policy the right way, anybody can pull out the calendar and figure out when their start date's going to be. It's not that big a mathematical equation. You know? <laughs> but it's, it, yeah. There are some people that can do it in their heads. I'm not one of them. Anything else? <laughs> So, so did you get the direction? Yeah, oh, definitely. And you know, we'll come up with uh, a survey methodology and uh, empower the uh, school councils to be part of the process. Uh, in, in I, I don't like using the word focus group, but to give us some inputs on pros and cons, etc. That way, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a lot of good information to consider. And, and as a school committee, you can take this information in and make a decision based on the best interests of, of the students that we serve. And, and there's, there's key, uh, that's a key point, and I, I don't want to bang that too much this evening, but you're never going to get consensus. Consensus doesn't even exist when you're looking at these kinds of changes, and nor should it. Uh, but the decisions that we make have to be in the best interest of the kids. Yeah. Sure. All right, great, thank uh, you. Uh, yep. just that, one, that just means you have to make sure you're framing the question appropriately that you're it's in the best interest of the education yeah. of the mm -hmm. kids right not what date would you prefer but right. what date would help you right. learn. what date what do you date think will help your, for your, your student exactly for your student yeah. academically academically right not right yeah. Yeah. but I think there's 
three stakeholders in that. There's the student, mm -hmm. the parent, and the educator. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's why, you know, you want to get the input well, from no, all three. Right, right. Yeah, no, let's be cautious. We'll use here. research methodology. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. And, it's, it's, and uh, it's, if we get too too finite in our question, yeah. what we really want is we want to know what, we want to know what these stakeholders think. Yeah. We, we want to know what our parents think. We want to know what our kids think. We want to know what our, our teachers think. But, and then from there, we can we can have those conversations. Right. We are, we are the ones, uh, or more correctly, as a school committee, you are, are charged with the responsibility of creating policies that uh, meet the academic needs of our students. As a superintendent, I'm here to give you advice and good information so that you can make that to those decisions. And, and that process needs to be crisp, uh, as, as inclusive as possible, and then we need to make a decision and move forward. Another interesting survey point would be if you could see other districts that changed their dates earlier or later and how it affected their MCAS or AP results. You know, Mark, I, I, that's, that's a, a wonderful su suggestion, but from an educational point of view, how many variables do we want to consider? Mm -hmm. That's an impossibility to, to isolate yeah, one yeah. variable. Yeah to determine whether or not it affected students. And I would even, I, I would argue too, I don't even know how many districts that actually change. I think the better question would be, what's, well boy, you'd have to control for so many variables, other variables. What's the impact for districts? How do districts that start before do versus districts that start after? But man, there's a lot of other things that would, that would confound that analysis. I don't think it works. Yeah, I don't think you can do it. Uh, but I don't know how you're surveying to find out academic success based on changing the date either, so. Well, it's not necessarily academic We're success in terms of quantifying. It's it's preference. Yeah, what you think is going to help your child, whether or not you could be wrong. We could all be wrong at any point about that, you know. And I, I agree with you. If if you could quantify it, then I think it would be more meaningful. I'm just struggling to think about how you would do that. But you're just, just getting opinions rather than anything that's fact. So we could look at. Do students who have 120 days of prep time for the AP exam do better or worse than students who have no, 125? Too many. There's variables too many other confounding variables. variables. Yeah. Performance you just, you there, can't, that it's not that simple. It wouldn't be that. Work. That wouldn't be necessarily be the determinant. It'd be a maybe be a determinant, but it wouldn't necessarily be the. It won't. Wouldn't be the determinant. If you had yeah, the same you teacher, would, how would you know how much of a determinant? Yeah. That's the, the problem. You got to be able. To but every time you do something like this, there are limitations, and you just have to know what those limitations are. Yeah. As, you, as you move forward. All right. All right. We'll obviously have more discussion about it. And I, I think we have a decent enough process at the moment to let's, let's get it started. And, and we've got a whole other discussion to have, which I think is going to be even more robust than that one. Yeah. Um, all right. All right. All right. Now we're going to talk about school day start time. Does anyone mind yes. if I start that? Discussion because could you put your jacket on? You're looking to get I, out of here. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys have to get up early. No, this is school day start time. It's not school committee end time. I, I, <laughs> go ahead. Um, among students, there's a lot of like, yeah, I'll get to sleep in like an extra two hours, but fear isn't necessarily the right word. There's a lot of concern for the students that do a wide range of extracurriculars after school that they're not going to be getting home. Because a lot of the sports teams, if they have a meet, they're not getting home till 6 to like 8 each night sometimes. So I think they're more concerned if they're not starting practice until 3 or 4, they're not getting home till later, they're not even starting homework till later, so they're still being up as late as before, maybe even later, so they're, the amount of sleep they're getting isn't necessarily longer. Mm -hmm. all right. Thank you. Anything else? That's all I have on that. We'll hold on to that one. Libby, I would like to say your, your contribution to tonight has been very, very helpful. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. And I will contact um, Mr. Mazzoni to try to work out a thing for the students. Do you know his dad? <laughs> yeah. What? My, dad, dad? my dad's not going to have any interest yeah, in this. That's Mr. Mazzoni. <laughs> this is Mike Mazzoni. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk to Alex and I. We'll talk to Kelly and Mr. Harrington and the rest of the group to see what they want to do. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Mark, school. St we started down that end. We're going to keep going. <laughs> school day start times. Thoughts, comments? So. Um, I don't have um, as much 
uh, I have a bit of an opinion on this, but I don't have as much fact on it other than the research that's been going around that says the high schoolers should start later. Um, as far as sports and things go, there's schools that start later and they seem to manage just fine. Like Parker starts much later than we do and still has a full sports contingent. So it must be possible. Um, I don't know how it works. But What's much later? Like I'm just curious. Like, I don't know what time I is Parker start? I think they start at 8.30. 8.30. I don't know. Like about an hour, an hour over, a little over an hour long. Okay. So. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Go. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about it a little bit and, you know, trying to just run through what kind of different options uh, that we have uh, here, you know, and, and uh, one of them comes is just the spread of start times that we have between our classes, mainly because I think we do three bus runs instead of two bus runs, and there's a cost of impact uh, to that. Uh, other things thinking about in terms of sliding the start time back uh, on it. And another thought was, can, do we reorder the start times? Do um, we slide the high school back and keep in the three bus runs, slide a different school up to start a little earlier? I still do have concerns, though, on, you know, how early the day starts uh, there. You know, the 6.30 bus pickup so it is early. Uh, uh, there uh, and no matter what we do, none of the the only one that starts to address that without the stop times becoming excessive is the financial implication of running a different bus schedule mm -hmm. uh, there um, on it. I personally would like to see the high school time you know closer to eight o'clock rather than seven o'clock or seven fifteen for the first start time. It doesn't have too much of an impact because I don't want finishing practice running into dinner uh, there. Right now, I think, you know, even if we slid it a little bit there, you could still wrap the day up at a reasonable time for <coughs> normal uh, extracurricular activities uh, there. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that start coming into play uh, that I think we need to, to uh, to uh, be thinking about because I did notice that um, you know several of the schools ended up with like an eight o'clock start time and uh, I looked them tried to look them all up uh, but it was you know and and I think wrapping up at two thirty rather than two o'clock uh, type of thing there so it affected the end of the day but not as massively as moving it to like a nine thirty or ten thirty start time which <coughs> I don't I. You, d you can't finish an extra activity until after 6.30 at night if you start doing that, mm -hmm. uh, which means, you know, family dinners, all of the other traditional family things. Oh, sorry, traditions, but <laughs> some people still value those. <laughs> uh, there, as well as, um, you know, even tonight with the cross country, the indoor track meet, that's not going to wrap up until 8 o'clock. Um, and I'm pretty sure she's got homework that she'll be doing when she gets home tonight uh, kind of thing there. So that end time is, we got to be cognizant of how, how that gets affected there. So I, I just thought about a bunch of options, but I don't know, you know, there's a pros and cons associated with each one. Um, I'm thinking that we might want some kind of process to sort of like maybe tick out the different options, the pros and cons from the student side, the school side, and some of them have a resource cost implication there so that we can try to see how do we come to balance of, of the, um, the different um, trade-offs essentially that are gonna, gonna go there. And then is that something that we wanna put on that multi-year vision is, is we'd like to move to a two bus uh, run system and this is the cost uh, for it. Uh, and what would be the possible implementation timeline uh, on it. But I, I don't think we can jump to those conclusions this soon. There, there's another, on playing on the sports line, it, it, there's <coughs> an extra cost that you haven't actually considered if you push the school start time back too much is that your fields will be dark when you're <coughs> playing the sports. Yeah. So you're going to have to either come up with lighting on the fields or some other schedule. Yeah, that's why I think realistically the 10 o'clock start times is not, it doesn't work on the back side right. of, the, of the, the equations there. Good. Mike? I think Daryl just nailed the analysis of it. I, my, my personal belief is that the school times ought to be later, um, and it's just a question of figuring out logistically how to do that. And I, that we know that other people are doing it, um, so if it's a question of finding a way of getting 
the outdoor sports that rely on or that you know that tend to be later in the day, rotating them through a lighted field, um, the basket, you know, looking at the finances, there's we're gonna have to just I think do exactly what Daryl said, which is go through all those considerations and seeing, you know, finding we're gonna find a problem with a bunch of them and finding ways to address the, each of those problems step by step is probably necessary. Probably help meeting with people like Parker and other schools that we know that do that would be helpful to see how they solve those problems. Um, I think to Olivia's point about staying up later in general, I think the science is in so clearly and definitively that um, I don't want us to ignore Simple. I don't want us to not do this because of simple problems. If they if they exist and we can tackle them, then I'd like to talk about it. Um, to, to Olivia's point about coming home later and staying up later, the science, and I remember when I was in high school, you, not, your biological clock doesn't let you go to sleep at 10 o'clock. So whether you're doing homework or otherwise, you're up till midnight and then waking up at 6 o'clock or 5.45. So my inclination is that I do tend to prefer having the start time later. I don't, I'm not interested in making a jump to 10 o'clock or something like that, but if there's something reasonable in between where it doesn't have a huge, tremendous back end um, effect, then I think we should explore it. And I think I just redeemed myself to 16 year old Mike. I'm kidding for that. It's all about the net. I just want to add a couple of comments because I think we covered a good deal before you got to me, which is nice. Um, I think the research is pretty clear, and I think we've talked about that a lot um, in previous meetings, that we know that schools start too early for students. I think the bigger question is, what do you do about that? A um, couple of things. According to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in Littleton, less than 10% of high school students in Littleton get what the National Sleep Foundation considers to be enough sleep. Um, that's what they call eight and a half to nine and a quarter hours. They consider that to be a good amount of sleep and less than 10% of uh, high school students in Littleton and also around Massachusetts and across the country are saying that they're getting as much sleep. It's not because Littleton students are you know, drinking way too much coffee. Um, it's, but this has been a problem that we've seen for a number of decades. And the research on school start times and their impact on student sleep and academic performance have been around since the early 90s, uh, which actually was before most, if any, high school students had cell phones and were up at that on computers. There's really some of that happening then, but uh, that's really not a great thing to do to your circadian rhythm is a stay up staring at a screen all night like I'm doing right now. But it's not a it's not a problem caused by the cell phones or caused by the computer use. It's probably worsened by that, but it's been around for a lot longer. Um, school start times in Massachusetts and in Littleton have only been this early for since about the 1970s, 1980s. There was a big push to start high school and middle school earlier. Um, part of that was budget. Part of that was because uh, two parents were going to work instead of one parent was going to work, and so that was an impact. Um, and those are all things that we want to keep in mind as we go about this process. Um, sports, buses, I don't think anyone's mentioned after school daycare or child care or tiger den, but that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, it's all really, really vital to keep in mind as we go about a process. What a lot of communities, can you tell them a nerd about this issue? Can anyone tell you? <laughs> what a lot of communities have done um, is they will form some sort of group outside of the school committee level that really includes represent representatives from parents, students, um, a doctor or psychologist, um, usually a community member who takes that role. And then of course you want to keep your, um, I think it would be good to keep someone from the athletic department or the coaches um, involved in that as well, um, as well as uh, buses. So you want to Essentially, we all know the research is, is, is abundantly clear at this point um, that early school start times are not healthy for adolescents. The question is, how do you fix it? And because we, just 30, 40 years ago, were starting school at 9 a.m., I think there's a way to, to fix it. I'm not suggesting we go all the way back to 9 a.m., but I think there's a middle ground and there's a way to do it, and it does work. 
the tricky tricky parts to figure out how do you shift, how do you make the shift. Um, the CDC, I believe it was uh, last year, the National Centers for Disease and Control said that they recommended that schools not start before 8.30 a.m. for high schools and middle schools. Um, I'm not sure if they may have included K-12, to I'm pretty sure it's just middle school and high school. So has the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, um, between 8 and 8.30 is that window. I don't think that we're going to get Olivia another two hours of sleep in. I don't think we're going to get the 9.30 or 10 o'clock start, as wonderful as that might be. I think there's a way to move in that direction with either an 8 or an 8.30 start. Um, and there are a number of different models. There's adding more buses, which does have a financial cost. Um, or there are flip times, um, slightly later times. Um, as I believe, Mark, you said that Parker starts at 9.30. Well, how do they do that? I think they start at 8.30. 8.30, sorry, 8.30. Um, a little more than an hour after our high school. I think what often happens here, and I think I was really glad that we had the last conversation we had first, because I think we really talked a lot about process. First, we talked about, well, what's good for the students? What does the community want? And on the calendar issue, it wasn't abundantly clear this is or is not. We don't know yet which is going to be best for the students. On this, we do. There's still a question of process. There's still a question of, well, what's it going to cost? What are we trading for it? But on this issue, I think the difference is that we know what benefits the students. And so I think uh, as we move forward, when we talk about process, my hope would be something to the effect of getting a bunch of people from different backgrounds, from different um, stakeholders in the room, talking about it, and then soliciting community feedback, coming up with a couple of proposals, and then analyzing the costs and benefits of each one, and then presenting them back to the school committee and the community at large for discussion, and then in consideration, that kind of thing. Okay. I, I have one other question. Are there any contractual obligations for school to start time with either the teachers or the buses or? It, it, there, there, there can be uh, changing working conditions. Is, is something that you need to be cognizant of. Right, it's just kind of a generic concept. Is not. I think your your question is: Is there anything specific about start times in the contract language? Not in the contract. Not in the contract language. But Kelly's point is perfectly valid. It's conceivable that if we did do something, that they would try to argue that that is a change in working conditions and it needs to be collectively bargained, and we would have to figure that out. Um, we can go a lot of different ways, but. So that, okay. okay. Um, I, this one, I actually think we do have consensus across the board here, um, and I think in the community. Uh, I think we can all agree that for, for middle aged and high school kids, if we can find a way to start later, that's beneficial. Well, I don't think anybody's going to argue that you can't. I mean, it's yeah. out there. I think the, but I think the consensus we also reached tonight is starting at 10 o'clock is not going to happen. It's just not, we can't do that for a variety of reasons in a, in a vacuum. If, if the whole state wanted to think about it and, and get a, a, their arms around how that would change, you know, sports and other extracurriculars and things like that, then we, you know, we could definitely do that. But we, that's not going to be able to happen in a vacuum. So now the consensus is, okay, we're not going to go to 10 o'clock, but we might be able to work a schedule out that we can get towards 8, 8.30, whatever we think is appropriate and, and manageable. And Daryl talked about, you know, maybe a, a way to do it is, is to come up with, you know, these various types of op options along with the clause benefits and, and, and issues, logistics, devil in the details type stuff, and then we can evaluate it. Um, you know, Alex, you talked about conceivably forming a committee and, you know, grabbing different input. I would think that would be more relevant if we were trying to decide if it was a good idea. I, I think that that's already been determined. So now it's more about execution and what can we, what do we feel we can do and what's feasible and at what cost and what impact, not just bu budget-wise, but cost and impact relative to the other buildings that might be affected, staffing, you know, all those kinds of things. I think that it's it's well within our purview and our capacity as a school committee and with our admin team to frame three to you know seven scenarios and then debate them and, and evaluate them you know the way we, we do these types of things um, and I kind of think that's what I, w I think we should do I think we have enough consensus that if we can we can come up with some good ideas let's let's figure out 
can we execute? You know, and what's yeah. the benefit of executing? I would have actually said there's somewhere uh, a ground in between where uh, a few of us and the administration and parents subcommittee and type thing. Yeah, so it doesn't yeah. have to be a formal committee. It's a right. working group that's right. going off and yeah. saying right. this is what's going. Th we investigated. This is what the cost will be to this proposal, and so on right. and so forth. Right. And comes back to us and says, "You wanted this time. Here's your choices, and this is how much each of them is going to cost. My, that way, you're not overburdening any one." Right. Yeah. My, my thoughts on it would be is is um, you know uh, to some maybe perhaps put together. I call it sort of a structured public hearing uh, on it, where we do a little bit of homework, outline several candidate options from what we're talking about here, what kind of a you know, preliminary input we get uh, here do a rough cut at some of the things there so that we can have a, a, a facilitated structured public hearing type of thing on it so that it's not I'm not one that try to have, get all the input from a blank sheet of paper I don't think we get to where we need to go uh, but likewise I don't want to present it that this is the done deal uh, type of thing here because I think there's maybe other options on it so that we could then quickly more come back towards here's the rough cut here's it refined with some more additional inputs let's use this as the decision basis for where we want to go yeah. uh, on it uh, there because I think the part that we won't really get from the public hearing side of it is what's the impacts of our ability to actually execute it uh, they really only get that that's why I think we need for to Mark's point the working group and maybe Daryl we could do this before we come up with some structure yeah um, candidates but we need the athletic director we need someone who can jump the hurdles as yeah. we get to them so we need the bus people in the room together so that we're not just sitting here well, saying the buses could be a problem and we athletics. need somebody to talk to the bus company we don't need I, I, I don't need, need someone who can come president up. of the bus company to come no, no, we need someone who can answer that question is it feasible to uh, move uh, forward we need someone from athletics to be able to say if we move it a half an hour that'll work that, you know we can move X these sports hockey team basketball team any of the indoor stuff isn't gonna be affected but we need somebody who can answer those questions before we throw it out to a public hearing. We need someone to be able yeah. to say, it's we can move, we exactly. Have, we you have, have an administration that can do that for us, though. That, I mean, that, that, it, yeah. I'd like to offer some, some yeah. suggestions yeah. or yeah. some yeah. advice. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is a, a more complex topic from the previous one. Uh, if we're going to do something, it has to be meaningful, and it has to be able to be actualized. And I spent some time on this, actually a lot of time on this, because I would have loved to come to you with a solution but there is no solution that doesn't have pros and cons. That's common sense. If we, and I'm going to back up just, just for a second, we are in a state of restorative budgeting as, as, as a district. We cut money four years ago and cut staff. Our class sizes are increasing. We need to set our priorities in terms of vision budgeting. What are our priorities in terms of what do we need? What, what's our greatest need? Uh, the array of possibilities perhaps aren't as great as, as one would think. If we combined the two elementary runs, that Shaker Lane and Russell Street School, we would be looking at a price tag added to our budget of approximately $300,000, give or take 20 grand. So you have to ask yourself, out of all the things that we need to do to actualize our Vision 2020, uh, realizing that our town is growing, it's going to bring more students in, which is going to add more cost to busing to begin with, you know, is that a plan or is that even an option? And that's something that, that you know, you're going to have to decide as a school committee. Uh, no matter what we do in a cost-effective manner to create a, a, a workable schedule, somebody is going to be starting a little earlier, maybe perhaps not as early. We have a certain degree of flexibility, but you always have to look at, at, at so many different factors in these things. Uh, for example, right now in our high school, every day our teachers offer 45 minutes of time that our students can sit down with teachers and get extra help. That's a, a kind of a short window because then they have to travel. And then you have to take into account that uh, the schools that we compete against are not determined by area, they're determined by school size. So that creates a more convoluted picture. <clears throat> I sent you a video today, 
that I don't know if you had time to, to watch it, but uh, I firmly believe that, that this decision would be far more effective <coughs> if a number of districts did it together. And, and we may not have that luxury, uh, but it's something to consider in our dialogues. Uh, in order to, to be cost effective, and it would never be cost neutral, but as neutral cost as we could possibly come up with, we would have to have one of our schools, either Shaker Lane or Russell Street, Russell Street School, start earlier. Uh, to me, Shaker Lane, it would be very tenuous to try to do that because we have so many different family scenarios in town. They're younger students. You want to make sure that, that they, they have uh, uh, something in place for, for these students after school. And, and we have routines established by families in our community. We have to take that into account. So you, then you start looking at Russell Street School. They're a little older, but they still need guidance. Uh, they, we, we, they can't be lock key kids, so to speak. <coughs> So you have to look at, okay, how much flexibility do we have to run those buses as is? And uh, I took an opportunity to, to create a scenario, and it would have Russell Street start uh, earlier than it does, but not too earlier. But even when I did that and sat, started to sit down and collect data with the athletic director, for example, it was interesting how, how the conversation morphed into a number of factors. For example, in our town, we compete, or not compete, we share fields with Park and Rec. A lot of communities don't have to do that because they have way more fields. So the field use has to be taken into account if we dismiss high school at a later time. Travel time has to, to be taken into account. If we dismiss later and they travel an hour and a half away for a game, then they're going to get home later. They're not, they may not be home by 10 o'clock, depending on where they're traveling. A lot of times they will. Uh, then we have to take a look at fall sports. I think it impacts fall sports more than any other sport because your daylight time is decreasing as, as, as fall becomes winter. And uh, then we have to take a look at, well, what, do, what is that going to mean in terms of uh, practices? Practices, not as much, but games. We're going to have to take a look at lighting for fields. So well, then you take a look at lighting for fields, but then you have to worry about uh, other concerns, uh, mosquitoes, triple E. So we'd have to spray our fields more. And, and, and so it, there isn't a, a simple solution. We're really going to have to, again, figure out some parameters in terms of what we're comfortable doing, get input, public input, and then as a school committee, again, make the decision in the best interest of, of, of the students. <coughs> I'm really struggling with the fact that it would be very hard to maintain that 45-minute uh, time span for our kids to receive extra help from teachers. But I think that's very valuable, and I think that directly affects academic process. Or, I'm sorry, academic progress, not process. <laughs> so, it's, it's after 9.30 this way. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm in favor of later times, and, and, and I mean, a myriad of things have been done throughout the nation, and, and some states have policies that say you can't start before 8.30, and that, that gives you that guidance. I don't think it's going to happen in Massachusetts, to be honest with you. Uh, there are ways to start high school later. We just have to make sure that, that we take a look at what we need to do to make this successful. And those fall sports uh, in that study time are, are a challenge as we move forward. And then students, if, if we start one of those, those elementary schools earlier, what impact does that have on, on families? We have to really think about that as well. Uh, I don't think there are as many solutions as, as, as we would like to have, uh, especially if you really want to be conscious about spending more money on busing. And to me, that, that wouldn't be a top priority, to be honest with you. I wish we had that kind of money. But if we had three hundred thousand dollars, I can think of many, many ways that, that we would, that I would recommend that we spend that money. Not to say that a solution isn't there. We just have to, to really think this out. And, and uh, you know, I've asked Mike, our, our athletic director, to start talking around the table with the schools that we compete with. I think that, that's a start. There have been regional discussions going on, but uh, that's partially effective, only because. Who we play is determined by our, our, our population size of our high school. So just some things to, to consider. 
uh, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that a later start time would be beneficial. There's certainly no doubt in my mind, but how do you do it in a cost-effective manner? And how do you do it to make sure that we're not creating another issue at the same time? Um, I appreciate that, that input, and it, it helps to convince me that the, and, and Daryl's going to say, we have an admin team, and I think that the, the, the only way we're going to be able to figure out the feasibility of different options is with, they're the only ones can figure it out. And, and if we do it through a committee structure that has not enough of that or makes it more difficult or more pro, a more prolonged process for them to go through that, then I don't, I don't see the benefit of that. Um, I still think that it's, we need to go through, I want to go through the process, personally, I want to go through the process of evaluating, um, if, if only to ultimately understand why we, we're not going to do it now versus, you know, why we have to put it on a visioning type of spectrum versus an implementation spectrum, uh, you know, a more short, shorter term point of view. Um, so I, I definitely think we need to move this forward. I would definitely like to have it being driven with our input and input from the community. Um, but I also want us to keep control of it. it by us, I mean school committee with our admin team because they're really the only ones that are going to be able to give us the true picture of what the, what the implementation pros and cons, costs and benefits are going to be for different scenarios. It's just no matter how well-intentioned other people that get involved are going to be, they're just not going to have the wherewithal to be able to make those determinations. And without those determinations, I don't see the benefit of a plan, uh, of any particular point of uh, solution or, or type of uh, idea. If we, can, if we don't immediately put down, this is the impact, cost benefit, educationally, dollars, socially, whatever it is, you know, you're talking about after school care, you know, things like that. Um, they're the ones that have their finger right on that pulse better than, than any of us are going to be able to. Um, so I kind of want to let that, process, that drive that process. And we have several people that yeah. came tonight. Do we want to? Sure. Yeah, I think that's that a good idea. Place, yeah, because we can keep going. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, we're all just well. now we're just shouting into a void. We know the right. we know the problems. Right. We're not the ones. That no, that's a good idea. So, any community input on school day start times? Susan Jaleo, Lake Warren Drive. Um, I am a mama of middle schooler. I'm also a child psychologist, and. Um, I'm happy to hear that you all know how important research is. Um, I also understand there's logistical issues and money issues, but I think as a district, if our value is to educate the whole child and to um, make sure that our, our children of all ages are healthy emotionally, socially, and academically, that um, I'm really happy to hear the committee saying that this kind of has to happen. Um, as a mom of a middle schooler in sixth grade, I'd love it to happen sooner rather than later. Um, I also want to emphasize that I understand the change would impact younger students in Russell Street and Shaker Lane, but um, my kid on half days is home at 11 o'clock in the morning. And if people know about uh, adolescent development, um, those of us who work and have uh, tweens and teens home at 11 a.m. often, which is a whole other issue, but we have a lot of half days, um, that's not healthy either. So that's like another concern I have with the early start time is these early dismissal times. I mean, even a two o'clock dismissal is pretty early um, for kids that may not be involved in after school activities. Um, so again, I'm happy to hear that you're um, seriously considering it. And um, if there is a group put together, I do think it's important to, to keep a piece of um, the whole child in it. Because again, I understand the, the money and the, all that, but um, the, the bigger picture is really important. Yeah, I appreciate that point you're making. I mean, so I want to, when we talk cost benefit, it's not a dollar, it, dollars and cents is a component of cost benefit, but there's a, uh, many other components. Yeah, and I, and I understand that. that. So I just think the research is so, so profound that um, to not, and you know, for other, for other districts not to do it, I don't think it's responsible either. So my hope is maybe Little Tin can be sort of a, harbinger of you know innovation and sort of say we're listening to research it also sends a really good message I think to our students that research matters 
that when we get research, we act on it, and we don't just go, well, that's nice, but, you know, it's not convenient, um, which I know you're not doing, but I mean, I think that does send a, a, a message to our, to our students that when we do research and we learn from it, it impacts the next step. And I think just like you had talked about bringing in students into the school, the school year start date, I think this is also an interesting, my son is actually writing a persuasive essay about school start times. And he went, he's quoting the Atlantic, which I think is fabulous. <laughs> and um, so, so that conversation is happening in the schools now among the kids. So I think that's really exciting. And I think that would be a nice way to kind of get them involved as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori Hine. My son is also a sixth grader at the middle school this year, and I came tonight just to tell you on behalf of myself and a lot of other parents how much difference a half an hour or an hour would make to him in the morning. Um, he has been either the first or second kid on the bus route in the morning every single year of his academic career in Littleton. So this year, we pay for the bus, but we actually drive him in the morning just so that he can get that extra half hour. And I know I'm not the only one in that situation. So it doesn't sound like a lot of half an hour or an hour, but I know for this child who uh, is very enthused about school this year and Kudos to everyone at that school. What a great transition from a great job transitioning those kids from Russell to, to the middle school. Um, the, the timing is really an issue for him. So um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but I think, I think it would make a big difference. And um, in terms of somebody who's always had to balance that end of the day equation, um, in my experience, the difference between him getting out or even the younger kids, because w we faced the same issue when he was in Shaker, at uh, two versus three in the afternoon, it's not as much of a change as you'd expect because either you're lining up care for that entire block between two and five or six, or you're not, or you have some other kind of arrangement. But that one hour isn't going to change either the convenience or the cost equation for the parents very much at, at, at Shaker. So thanks for your time. Thank you. I don't know how to share a few notes as long as I have copies. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. You don't sure. have to take notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just made a few bullet points. So, um, for those of you who don't have copies, I actually have a couple of extra copies. You can. Thank you. Thank you. I guess my, um, a quick few bullet points. My proposal is I'd like, you know, I'd like to see if the school committee would thoughtfully consider the impacts of changing the high school start times. Um, the facts everybody knows about the studies. Um, there's even a stat I pulled up about how it seems like in Massachusetts we're uh, a, a little more against change that more than 85 percent uh, start before 8 o'clock now uh, as of 2012 versus the rest of the country it's about 40 percent uh, start before 8 o'clock. Um, well, I want to highlight some towns that have already changed and I, uh, and I think uh, there's good study on that. Hingham in 2003 you know changed from 720 to 8 Duxbury in 2009 changed from 7.30 to 8.15. Sharon in 2010 changed from 7.25 to 8.05. Um, also some notable towns that are considered changing, Belmont, Burlington, Lexington, um, Newton, Wakefield, Wilmington. Um, Needham also already has an 8 o'clock start time. Um, and so what I pointed out here is I thought Sharon High School's website, which I attached here, has, um, I think has a model that maybe we should think about. Um, they ended up switching their start time after they did a considerable amount of uh, um, research. Uh, and they have all that online. 
they have all the presentations, they have all the meetings, they showed exactly what they looked into. They studied both Hingham and Duxbury because they had five years worth of experience. Um, and it was very nice that they actually put this all online. And anybody can go see, there's a, a ton of information on their website. Um, that's it. Sorry, I forgot to mention Clem Barry, Chris Mill Road. <laughs> <laughs> you already did it once. You only have to do it once a meeting. All right. All right, fine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's some great material. It would yeah. be very helpful. Can I add one on the earlier point about uh, switching Shaker Lane from um, ending earlier? It might impact parents on the other end in that they might not have to send their kids to Tigerston before right. school, right. right? It's going to help them more than it will. More likely to help them than hurt them. Mm -hmm. Good point. I'm Bartlett Hardy from Mill Road. I want to say thank you for taking this issue seriously. It's it's been a concern of mine for a long time. I want to make a proposal of speaking to uh, what Olivia said. Um, I'm going to suggest that you not only make the school day start later, but you lengthen the school day because the class periods are too short to be right now. And if you have a longer day and a later start, the kids will be more awake and get more work done. And I think we can argue that there would be less homework. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. I'm not going to guarantee that. And I also want to suggest that you talk to the teachers about how awake the kids are in AMOD, because it's generally a lost time period. Thank you. Else. Mark, thank you for saying that. That was one thing that was I was waiting to get up and ask. You know, what time does Targets Den start for the younger kids? Because um, I know when my children were young, they were up at the crack of dawn and they were raring to go and couldn't wait to get to school and school started so late and I can't tell you how many parents said, this is crazy, why don't the high school students start later, like at the Shaker Lane time? I mean, we've talked about this for, for 20 years, no kidding. So I don't know if things have changed dramatically for families who have younger children right now and somehow their children go to bed later or something and get up early, but that was just never the case when, when my children were growing up. They were always tired at night and went to bed early and got up early and we have the exact opposite with the older s students they they don't they're not tired they're up late and they just can't get out of bed so uh, I'm a huge advocate for swapping the high school and middle school for the shaker lane time and if we really don't want to deal with changing the buses literally just swap the two um, I'd love to hear what young families think about that you know it would be really great to get more significant input um, it would be also interesting, you know, if we really were concerned about if we start later for the high school students and there's concern about, uh, personally, I think I've had children on enough sports teams, pretty much every school that we've ever had to go against is about 30 minutes away or less. Um, some are a little bit longer, but there aren't many. Typically, there's one game a week. Um, there's not often multiple um, um, competitions in the same week, so you're talking one day that they may have to actually leave before they could get extra help if they needed to. Um, certainly we have an indoor track student and yeah, he's, he got home at 9.30 tonight. <laughs> but um, that, they didn't leave the school till three. So he had from two to three for help and homework. Um, so it, it varies, but a lot of the practices don't start till three at the high school and that gives them a full hour for homework help or going home or whatever they want to do. Um, so th there is some play, I think, in the schedule more than we might be thinking. Um, if there's not enough, you know, maybe there's something where the teachers actually offer help before school starts and kids could get up a little early. Granted, the buses may not run, but a lot of high school students don't take the bus. There's less of a rider, you know, input there than there is on the younger end. So it, it, there, there are definitely, I really, I'm pleased you're really strongly considering this and going to do the research. I really think there's enough flexibility in there that it may not be as difficult as you think to potentially solve this and make it beneficial to everybody. 
but certainly getting input and finding out what the impact is to families is important. And then hearing about maybe some of the flexibility that um, on the teachers, especially for the older kids, what they might be able to do as far as extra help times, maybe shifting the time, maybe uh, some of that. But and, and hearing from the coaches, but I think actually is very doable. We have students in other schools, and they go till 3:15, and they still compete. Now, granted, sometimes they have to leave before the end of the day, but typically there's an excused you know, time and it's a short period of time and it doesn't really impact um, their schoolwork or their participation either way. Um, so I think this is sort of the shift that we're going to see from all schools. Um, but so thank you and I really want to continue to hear this happening and, and the sooner the later, I mean the sooner the better because I do think it really does significantly impact so many of the students. Definitely in high school, and in middle school, high school the most. So. As Willy Wonka once said, we have so much time and so little to do. Mm. Oh wait, strike that, reverse it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else? Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Um, there have been a couple. And I'm not sure, uh, Glenn, if you if you remember what towns, but there were some towns in Massachusetts that were able to. Uh, have either a cost neutral or a, if we're talking about budget, uh, some savings um, from the shift. And they start I, somewhere on the Cape, I think, a uh, small town, not maybe a little bigger, smaller than ours. I forget, what, I forget the name of the town. Um, but they made the shift and they started by not by expecting to have to pony up some money to do it. And then they found some other way just by going through the process. And we were talking earlier about a vision budget. And at, at least if we had a list and we went through the options and the cost and how we would implement and said, okay, well, we can't actually do this, but at least we've had the conversation, we know why. I think that that philosophy is so important, not only when we talk, when we come to budgeting, but when we come to uh, this approach. Because there are, there are gonna be costs to some of the options. Some of the options won't have costs financially, but they will have other costs on social scheduling, um, other groups of students, sports, that kind of thing. I think we have a number of community members who are interested in this. Um, and I think when we look at the school districts that have successfully uh, changed their start times, and again, Glenn might know more about this than I do, um, but of the ones that I know, they have all had some capacity, whether you call it a task force or a working group, um, some group that brought in the outside players um, and the administration absolutely needs to be a part of that um, because I think you're right if we're without the administration at the table uh, we're going to be flying blind on a lot of issues that just aren't coming up at the same time um, I actually hadn't thought of the Tiger's Den issue in the morning I thought about it in the afternoon but it didn't occur to me in the morning after, oh some parents if we switch uh, elementary schools a little earlier wouldn't be spending money at Tiger's Den and they, that would be a cost that they would no longer have to pay. Um, that didn't occur to me, and I'm sure there are so many other things that we haven't considered and that, uh, that we can't all come up with right at the drop um, without bringing in more minds. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, you want to open it up. As, uh, I can have a guess what that expression was about. You don't want to open it up to the whole world because then you're not going to get anything. Well, no, I, my, my comment to that would be, I actually think that this group, along with our admin team, I don't think there's any aspect of it from a practical in impact in determining how it's going to affect the day-to-day -day operation of the district. We'll figure all that out. We're not going to forget any part of that. The community in terms part. of how it affects the families and their, their daily lives, that we can't figure out because everybody does their business a little bit differently from family to family, house to house, you know, age group to age group. That part we can't do. But in terms of figuring out how it's going to impact Tigers Den or athletics or buses or anything else. We're not going to get anything out of the community if we don't already have the ability to figure out. <laughs> I'll, I'll give ourselves a little more credit than, than that. Um, I think it would be helpful on the back end to come up with any last considerations about weighing the benefit of having Tigers Den in the morning versus not and coming up with creative solutions for fixing, you know, when, when, we, when the administration presents us with the options, they've run through their analysis, they'll tell us what the problems are, the pros and cons, then at that point, if you open it up, either in a structured hearing or get a group of people together twice to meet on it, then they can they then the community can weigh the benefit of Tigers in the mornings versus not. 
busing early versus not, um, having lighted fields or not, at that point then they can have creative uh, discussion of that. But I do think taking the first stand at with the administration. Okay. Well, I think we have one more community member that would like to get up there. I think we're going we're gonna to go pretty good after we, we yeah. do this. So I want to just get that done now rather than bring it back to her. Who's manning the cameras now? Do you oh, need me to go back? Go ahead. You can switch it back to me if you want. Um, Judy Reed Osgood, Pamela Way. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, middle school actually starts the earliest. Yep. 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 To me, that's the, and I can't remember the science, that's the age group that needs the most sleep to me. Um, so if any way we could switch that around, that would be good. Also, they're the ones that seem to get out the earliest on early release days, where you get emails from Mr. Branco saying, hey, please watch your kids because you're causing havoc in the town center. So you come up with the after school problem. Tiger's Den starts at 7 a.m., by the way, since somebody was asking that. Um, there is no after school care for middle school students. You go right from fifth grade, sixth grade, these kids are 10 or 11 years old. All of a sudden, there's no after school program for them. What do you do? They're out on their own running around, latchkey kids, or whatever other thing you have to do. I would like to see them start later. The Shaker Lane kids, I know little ones um, that I have experience with, they're up at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning naturally. So why do we have them going at 9 o'clock? <laughs> you know, they're, they're driving you nuts for three hours before you get them to school. So switching the time around, I don't think it's going to affect as many families as much as you think. I think that you're going to definitely have to talk to Tigers Den and busing and things like that. But another weird thought that I have sitting back there, um, listening to all of you for hours, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that you why do we have, what, what, what is, to help solve the busing thing, I don't know if it is, would be good or bad, but right now we have all of our schools segregated by age group. Why don't we have it redistricted to be parts of town? So Shaker Lane and Russell Street, I haven't been here long enough to know why we did the separation of pre-K through two and, and three through five, but one half of town versus the other half of town, would that help busing? I don't know. Yeah. The, so it would help a, busing, but the other trade-offs in terms of the way you set up the buildings and the materials and the resources right. and everything else, you wouldn't be able to make it. Th th that cost would, would more than offset the benefit you would get by having neighborhood schools, for right. lack of a better term. And then the other um, thought would be if you have... I mean, it's an intriguing concept, no question. If you have the middle school go later, then do you put the middle school and Russell Street at the same time because... Same campus. How many... Right. Same campus. Yeah. Um, you know, how many middle schoolers take the bus? You know, Paul's mom. Um, right. Just said she drives. I know a lot of other parents that drive because they don't want to be sending the kid down the bus at 6.15, 6.30 in the morning. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, when I was thinking about this, uh, I, had, I had always included the middle school. The circadian patterns don't differ that much between middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. Actually, they don't elementary, by the way. <laughs> but uh, younger kids do get up earlier. It's a typical pattern. Uh, so I, uh, personally, I had never separated the middle school from the high school. I think, I it, think really it, it needs to be part of the package, whatever that package is. Well, here's the other thing. When you talk about after-school activities and travel teams, the high schools that I know of have more travel teams for sports mm -hmm. than the middle school. So if you lump the middle school and Russell Street together, maybe that'll help solve some of those athletic field questions. Also, if you put the high school at the 8 to 2.30 Russell Street time, and you put the middle school at the 9 to 3.15 Shaker Lane time, that might also help that half an hour here or there. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> um, <Not anyway. laughs> so it's, you know, if, if you kind of, Mr. Clenchy, like you said, kind of separate the high school and the middle school a little bit, that might help you out with busing and fields and stuff. Those were a couple things. I have things about vacations and other stuff too, but um, <laughs> wait till another day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Any anybody else? Um, all right. Good. Um, all right. So let's think about 
next steps and, and how we want to go about it. We kind of started that, but let's let's see if we can finish it. Um, so I'll advocate again for the working group and the task force for a couple logistic reasons. One, as a committee, we can't do anything without having an open hearing and quorums and everything else. A task force can keep working off on their own, and there's going to be a lot of times that these are more quick meetings where you're going to have something that we need to find out this information or this information, and you're just getting together to exchange status, right? They're not voting on anything. They're coming back with proposals. I would also argue, based on what we just heard, that the community feedback might be important because the administration just admitted that they didn't consider moving the separating the middle school and the high school. We need people to be able to think outside of the box and not just be one of us, right? I think a task force or a working group that's not composed of a quorum of school committee members, but includes the administration and has access to whoever they need, will get through this in a much quicker and smoother process than we will as a committee. And your point, if 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 you make the assumption that the only time we would do business on this in a quorum, then you're right. But I don't concede that point at all. Um, I don't think there's any reason why we need to do it as a quorum. We can certainly you know, have school committee members driving the process outside of quorum. We do it all the time. Um, so I don't consider that a huge obstacle. Um, and I'm going to circle back to something Mike was saying. I think really the way to think about it is certainly it's easy enough at the beginning of the process to get some community input. There's no question about that. And I, I wouldn't argue that we shouldn't. I think we should. I think we definitely should. Um, I'm more concerned about giving up, giving away the process to a task force because what typically happens is there'll be at least one or two, that I would think at least maybe two school committee members on it. But if the task force owns it, they drive it. It's not fair to them if we, if, we, if we don't let them drive it. And I feel like this needs to be driven mostly by the administration in terms of coming up with the being able to determine the impacts of the various whatever solutions we come up with. I have no problem asking the community and anybody else, whether it's going outside and getting outside players like a school psychologists or other school districts, getting them to help us frame different proposals. But at the end of the day, and the analyzing those proposals has to be driven by the school administration. They're the ones who understand better than anybody what the impact. And I don't want to have to ask a, a task force to go ask them questions. They should be sitting right there answering the questions as part of the process. Um, that, that's what we're paying them to do. Just a point of clarification. I know it's 10 after 10. Uh, that's not what I said. Uh, I, I, my assumption was that we were looking at middle school and high school at the same time. Uh, we did consider middle school separately, but it was cost prohibitive in, in, in terms of dollars that we would have to put up. When, when we started investigating this, uh, being prudent financially, we wanted to, to take a look at, at something that would meet the needs of our students, would be the best decision without costing us a lot of money. Uh, so I, I have a suggestion to make. Whenever you, you have these discussions, you need good information. The, the starting point to making good decisions is to have good information. So my suggestion to you is, is let's get Michael in at a meeting and, and have him map out what happens extracurricularly at the high school level. Where is our window of movement? I think if, if, if we're committed to changing those times, we can find a solution. But First of all, I think we need to know what that window is at the end of the day. That might be a good starting point. I, I, and, I think we I, need Mike Lynn's input. Uh, he's going to be a huge component of this. That's why I think he should be intimately involved from, from the hop on something like this. I don't know that it's going to help us right away to have him speaking at the podium. I would like to have him more as a resource. It's easier for me if people write it down. Here are, you know, yeah. the, if we move it back a half hour, we can see the exact exactly, right. right. Exactly. If we move, move it back, back an hour, hour right. Exactly. exactly. So I want that analysis. I just don't think okay. having him Fair up enough. here speaking yeah. towards. And then on the back really end, if he says way. there is going to be a problem if we move it an hour with lights, then when we throw that out there, you know what you're going to hear. You're going to hear people saying, "Let's build a turf field and light it, and let's right. build more right. soccer fields that, on the Cooper." Like then we can let people then debate the the obstacles that come up. Yeah, that, that's why I'm more in favor of, of having the administration outline, I call them pros and cons. There's 
whatever whatever the appropriate terminology is. I, I don't think we as a committee want to try to digest all of the raw data and come up with the proposals here. So I, I, that's why I'm, I think the administration needs to work with the, you know, the athletic director in terms of what is the impacts of these types of proposals or what's, what kind of flexibility do I have with the constraints on the athlete, from the athletic program. Well, however you want to look at it uh, there, uh, you know, but I don't think we want to get into the, the nuances of all that, that detail because right. at the end of the day we're not that's only one piece of it and we would have countless presenters coming up in front of here to present the science of their particular thing to us I, and uh, uh, if I may I agree that then we should do that we should get pros cons and obstacles and then I agree with Mark that we should have people who can think outside the box because at that point you're gonna have people who can creatively come up with ways to jump into those hurdles I, I think the task force I think I don't think we have a monopoly on the ideas. I think the administration has I all the I don't think anybody suggested that we I have, think, Mark. I think the you administration know. has all the information, right? And that I think you play putting the task force together, you're going to get new ideas that are going to play with the information that we, that the administration can provide, right? And come up with a coherent pros and cons. And I think if you put it all on the administration, you have the risk of Losing Nobody ideas. said to put it all on the administration. So can we agree, Mark, can you're, we agree really, we, you're twisting right. some of the things that have been said here. It, it seems like, Mark, your concern is not that they that the administration could construct um, possib uh, possible options and present some of the concerns that would exist there. Your concern for getting feedback is how to solve those problems. And well, we went through the presentation earlier where we said our central administration is doing more with with less. Now we're saying, let's give them all of this work to put something together to present back to us. What I'm suggesting is, let's other people come up with the ideas, write the presentation, and use the administration as their source for data, rather than putting more of the burden on the administration than we need to. I think there's a compromise here, and I understand the concern about uh, having it be a if it's a community driven working group where most of the members are not school committee or school administration that can pose an issue um, I'm less concerned about it I think than some other folks who've probably been here for more time than I have and more have more experience with it but I recognize that as a, as a concern so I'm wondering I, I agree that and one of my concerns here is we don't come up with our district strategic plan in a vacuum. Um, it's driven by the administration, it's driven by the school committee, and we go out at different points while we're still writing it, while we're still writing different options. We go out and see what people have to say about it. I think we can adopt a similar model here, obviously less intensive because it's not a five-year strategic plan. Um, but I think we could adopt a model here where we have a working group composed primarily of the administration, whether that's Kelly or Steve, who can talk about buses and bus schedules, certainly Mike Lynn or um, Mike Lynn, I guess, uh, pretty sad. Someone from school committee so we can report back as necessary. And then throughout that process, while the options are being generated, go out and say, oh, we're going to tap this parent who's written to us, you know, every week about this issue, or we're going to go out and talk to this person who's really interested in this and invite them to a meeting of the working group. That way it still, it doesn't, as um, I hope I don't uh, misquote you, Mike, it doesn't get out of, out of our hands. It remains a, a administration, school committee driven process, but we still include that community feedback that is not only helpful in coming up with the ideas, and, but it's also important, so, so important to the buy-in. Uh, I and would. I, that's fine. I would even argue that rather than every now and then go get one person or another, I have no problem getting people involved right away. As they can go to every meeting, have one person who wants to be involved go to every meeting. If he or she can make it, that's great. Or two people, or three people, whatever we think the right number is. I have no problem having people outside the administration or outside the school committee involved from the get go. I have no problem with that, and I would. My voice is rising a little bit because I take a little umbrage that someone suggests otherwise. My concern, and what, and you and I appreciate the way you phrased it, Alex, was 
I believe that we have the capacity as a school committee and as an admin team to drive the process. <coughs> and I don't want to give the process away without needing to. I think we can do it. I, I want community input. I solicit community input as much as we think is appropriate as soon as we want it, <coughs> which is now, as soon as we get the process going. No problem with that. But I, I think, think it's we need I, to drive it. I think it's insane that we've spent as much time talking about the, I, I think it's very clear, the, the problems, we all know the problems. Everyone's going to be able to come up with the exact same problems. There's going to be athletics. We've already done that a million times ad nauseum. I would charge that as quickly as Mark and Alex and whoever can gather a group of people to debate it, that we could ask the administration to go through. We're, you know, we're, we're not talking about moving it from 8 a.m. to noon. We're talking about maybe an hour tops, n only north towards it being late. We're not talking about it being earlier. So I think we could charge the administration to give us, to present um, three options or four, whatever they think is, feel is necessary with the, con with the facts because Mark, it doesn't to me make sense to form a committee to ask the questions we already know need to be asked, which are how much would it cost for busing, what would the implications be on the athletics, child care, students who work after school, the health benefits we know are out there. So I would charge that if the administration could come up with those things, put the facts out there, then at that point we get the feedback from our child psychologists in the audience and the people who have kids on athletics and then let them debate the pros and cons of those. To me, it doesn't make sense to start with the task force because it's a waste of time. And I, I feel like we don't need to talk about it any further because we know the same outcome. Eventually, we're going to have a group of people asking a group of questions. The administration is going to have facts for it, and then people are going to debate it. So, so if we just start with the administration coming up with the questions and answering them, and then if we have further questions, we can talk about it then. So whatever you do. Does anyone object to that, to starting with the administration getting an hour window and answering some? Well, I have a, a suggestion, I guess. Uh, uh, Mark, you're about to say something. I was going to suggest we just have a subcommittee. Like you have the budget subcommittee that's off meeting, you have a meeting, and whoever's going off and doing it, you just have to have a subcommittee of fewer than two or fewer of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And they're open meetings, and you invite the community, and you can even give them work to do if they're going to volunteer to show up. Mm -hmm. Right? It's effectively the same thing as the task force. Mm -hmm. Right? And so but it's still under our control. control. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just a comment. Uh, this has been a great discussion, and, and I, I agree with you. We've, we've kind of beat this thing around the bush a lot. Whatever you do, you need to use a solid methodology. And if you don't, it gets you in trouble. And my job is to prevent you from getting into trouble. If you're going to do this right, you need to get information from the majority of the community. Focus groups don't do that. It gives you good information, but it's only part of the methodology. You need to devise a survey with options, etc. But you need to be reaching 60% of your population. I mean, I'd like to see it higher, but if you know the results of surveys, that's a pretty high return rate. So I think we've had a great discussion, and I like the idea of a subcommittee. Uh, but the bottom line is the last thing you want to do is come to anybody with recommendations, and, and you can't verify your sample. It loses credibility so quickly. So I, I think I think we're going we're getting to the right track. So let's do this. Let's I think the consensus is subcommittee is fine. Let's pick two people off the school committee to start working with Superintendent Clenchy, Steve Mark, Mike Lynn, and then whoever else you guys think on the admin team would be appropriate and or teachers at the school, professional school based community. And then I would like that group to quickly determine what other inputs they want on either a regular or consulting base, as needed mm -hmm. basis. And come back to us, explain how you want to do it, we'll approve it, fix it, comment on it, whatever we want to do, and then we'll push the, right. push the process forward uh, with the information, going toward getting the information and coming up with some scenarios. And then, we can, and then the community, by definition, is going to come out. And, and, and that's great. That's what we want. That's what we're striving for. And I, I guess I got to be careful of how I actually <laughs> say this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you, Kelly. On the you, you know focus groups doesn't don't get you you know the uh, the broad opinion uh, there. Uh, at the same yeah. time, I think we have the broad consensus that uh, that something need, should be done on it. I agree. Uh, so, will you get consensus of what will be done? Never. 
So right. that's the part I don't care. I almost say we don't need to survey for that part. Right. We, we need to know what are some viable options, a couple of focus groups, inputs to get a rich set of options that we can quickly boil down to ones that are feasible and achieve our objectives. And we can have a quantitative statement of the pros and cons of those. Mm -hmm. I, I almost say a survey is not necessary of that because I, at the end of the day, I'm not sure everybody's going to say yes. I vote for this one, and, and well, you not. get two people, that, you know, and you get split at the end. So we we hamstring ourselves at the end of the process if we're not careful. At least you know what your community is thinking. A, a, a part I didn't say is, in order for people to give you information about how they feel, they somehow need information. Right. right. And that's something that the subcommittee needs to figure out. Right. Once right. you have the information, how do you get it in those people's hands, in the community's hands, more right. correctly? Right. So that they, when they say, I would like this, it's because they've had the information to think about it? Right. We, we, we've never struggled to get the information out there. We've struggled to get people to come and say, mm -hmm. I agree or disagree, because some things just don't engender input. They're like, that, that. silence is acquiescence quite often. It really is. This won't be one of those things. There will, silence will not be acquiescence. We will get, <laughs> it will happen. I, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, so let's go ahead then. Let's think about who would like to get involved uh, in this process. I certainly would. I knew you were going to raise your hand. That's why I was looking for a surprise of no one. I'll sign up. It's just an interesting puzzle to solve. Okay. All right. We've got everybody else okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm fine with that. Yeah, Perfect. Absolutely. Wonderful. Now we'll just talk circles around each other and you guys can talk about it. Yeah. Email me with what you're going with. Okay, I, I, would, I would ask that initially you guys just start. That's fine. But once we get going, post. Yeah. So that if one of us wants to come, we don't have to worry about it. I don't want one of us not to be able to come. If we, I mean, I'm in Littleton every day, so there might be plenty of times where I say, yeah, I want to go see what, what's going on, and I don't want to have to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it at the beginning because it's going to be more about process. Um, but I to do a clarification on that. If it's a subcommittee, we should post every time we meet. You should. You know, but I'm saying, like, if, if you guys need to get together to have a meeting, before you're ready to, you know, figure all that out, okay. you can do that. And then you're right. As soon as you find as it feasible, if you come up with a meeting schedule, post it. Done. You know, but you don't have a meeting schedule yet, so how are you going to post? Yeah. You know, so I wouldn't worry about posting the first one or two, but as you go through the pride, you know, now is, let's post, let's get it done, and then partly so that we don't violate the open meeting law, but also it just helps people understand when it's happening, and anybody that we don't, you know, deliver directly solicit to get involved can get involved anyway. You know, that's what that's what we want. So. If you're okay with it, I, I'd like to put Steve on the committee and you have me when you want. That's fine. Yeah, if you that's need fine. me, I'll be there. Yeah. We, uh, I can uh, have some differentiation. Perfect. And Perfect. Steve and I were just talking earlier today about how much the business office does. So All right. thanks for volunteering. Big smile there, Steve. Oh, okay. Hey, there it is. I knew we could get this. This smile. is like this is like Steve when Barack Obama, Obama volunteered Joe Biden to cure cancer. And <laughs> yeah, yes. we're we gonna close this yes. out. All right, so we're good. We're good on <laughs> Do that. We need a Great discussion. Thank you for the input on that. Obviously, you're gonna. There's gonna be a lot more to come. So um, that should that'll be good. All right. Last time, interested citizens on other matters. We are gonna fly through the subcommittee reports as quickly as we can. PMBC. Uh, I'll pass. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Budget there's subcommittee. Lot. What? Uh, there's a lot going on, but I, there's nothing directly relevant. Yeah, excellent. That's right. Perfect. Perfect. I appreciate your, your discretion. Yeah. Budget yeah. subcommittee, we can pretty much pass, too. We talked about really what we're working now on is providing that information into that model that we talked about earlier tonight. We have a meeting coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 We'll, we'll, let's do that. Let's come up with, at the next meeting we will come up with a whole calendar when we're meeting when the present public presentation is going to be and town meeting even and all that kind of stuff and that'll give us the uh the, the, the path that we're going to follow so that's good for that policy subcommittee uh i'm a little behind i've got a um daryl i know I 29 more to go <laughs> <laughs> then you get to start over again right? <laughs> true all right <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything else that we need to talk about this evening? No. no. Do we need an executive session? No. no. <laughs> Excellent. That was a scary question. I want to my heart make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. Second it. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Excellent. Thank you. Uh,